We're live whenever you're ready. We're going. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to a city council meeting tonight. Thank you for joining us in the council chambers and uh, on TV, online, on radio, wherever you're, you're <laughs> listening to us today. We appreciate you being here uh, April 16th, 2024. Um, here we are. And we'll get underway like we always do in, uh, in Spanish Fork with uh, a prayer and a pledge. Councilman Euler has the spiritual thought and prayer tonight. And I can't remember who has the pledge. Councilwoman Beck has the pledge. And then we'll get into our agenda. Thanks again for being here. No thought tonight, Mayor, just prayer. I'll okay. go ahead and give that. Father in heaven, we give thanks this night for the opportunity that we have to gather here. We are grateful for the great place that we live. And bless us this night as we make decisions that we can make the decisions that will help keep it that way. We are grateful for our community, grateful for those that serve in our community, especially for our first responders, and ask a blessing on them and their families. We ask you to bless our military and those that put themselves in danger to keep us safe and protect our freedoms. Bless those throughout the world that are dealing with turmoil and conflict at this time that they can find comfort. We're grateful for our Savior, grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ, grateful to live where we do, and we pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please stand and repeat the pledge after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to item C on our agenda, the 2024 Spanish Fork Royalty. It's always good to have princesses in the uh, audience. I'm going to turn it over to Councilman Took, who is uh, over uh, our Spanish Fork Royalty this year, and, uh, and introduce uh, who's here with us tonight. All right, thank you, Mayor. So if the new royalty would like to come up here to the podium, that would be wonderful. We'd love to introduce you to the City Council and also to the City um, Many of us have had the opportunity to work with you, amazing young women, and uh, just very proud of you for all your hard work and competing. We had 10 incredible uh, contestants, and, and you're the final four. And so it's great to have you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Just as means of introduction, feel free to raise your hand. I'm just going to say your name real quick. So as Miss Spanish Fork 2024, we have Hope King. First attendant is Emma Williams. Second attendant is Madison Keller. And third attendant, uh, Madison, Madison Bertain. Say that right? Britain. Britain, okay. I, I, should, I should know that. And then fourth attendant is Eileen Carlson. Wonderful. And then Jen Olson back there in the back is our amazing director who makes it all happen. <laughs> so um, I, I, we'd love to hear a little from each of you, but if not, for sure, you're, you're Miss Spanish Fork. Just love to hear what you love about Spanish Fork and, and then what you hope to, to do to implement your CSI this year. Maybe tell everybody what a CSI is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so CSI is your community service initiative, and each girl chooses something that they're passionate about that they're going to bring into the community. And what I love about our community is the sense of community that we have. And so I've been able to bring in my CSI Together We Empower, which is about using your skills and your talents to serve each other. So throughout my Erasmus Spanish Fork, I want to be able to use that and use my talent of dance to serve our community by offering free dance classes. And I would love to have my attendants introduce their CSX. So we'll start with Emma. Hi, I'm Emma Williams. My CSI is called Nourishing Neighbors. So what I focus on is healing food insecurity in our community through service. As we know, there are so many amazing organizations here, like Tabitha's Way, that I've been working with to be able to implement some really cool things right here in Spanish Fork. Um, food insecurity is a constant, ongoing issue, and as someone with experience in it, I am so thankful that I've been able to step in and serve in something that's so important to me. Hi, my name is Madison Keller, and my CSI is called Lift, Unite, and Recover, and it's focusing on helping those in our community that get injured. And in doing this, it's helping lift each other and uniting each other as these injuries arrive, because injuries are sudden, and they can be hard to go through. So I've created sunshine baskets to go in elementary schools to help kids at schools if they get injured to be able to feel loved and to bring a little sunshine into them. 
Hi, I'm Madison Burton, and my CSI is Serve Those Who Served You, focusing on military mental health. And being somebody who's been so highly impacted by our veterans and being surrounded by them all of the time, I think it is so important that we're able to focus on their mental health as well as create a safe space for them and help them to know that there are people out looking out for them when they need their help. Hi, my name is Isla Carlson. My community service initiative is Fill the Crown. Just filling the needs for the uh, children in our community and helping them with what they need help with. And if there's like a family out there, like if they're struggling, just helping them like bring light on their family and, and give them some brighter days to look forward to. Wonderful. Thank you, ladies, for uh, being willing to serve Spanish Fork this next year. We're all excited to get to see you around town at all the events and the different things and um, can get to know you better. I, Mayor, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, Miss Spanish Fork, what, what are you most excited about? I, it, I, I heard all of you on the night of your competition answer questions that when they were asked, I learned to turn to Stacy, and I'm like, I would die if that had to be in front of a bunch of people. But you, you, you all did so awesome. So I have no, no uh, fears of you being able to answer a question here. But what, what excites you more, uh, most about uh, serving Spanish Fork this year? Well, so my birthday is July 24th. Oh, my gosh. So we, got, we have a parade <laughs> on your birthday. I'm so excited to celebrate <laughs> yesterday's and also myself at the same time. So I'm so excited. How old will you be on the 24th this year? I'll be 22. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey, and everyone, you can find out more about your Miss Spanish Fork on Studio Chatter weekdays at 10 a.m. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Shameless plug. Shameless we, plug. Do, we just did a great very, interview. Very shameless. No. <laughs> well, your talents, really, uh, ladies, your talents they blew us away, blew me away, and, and uh, everybody in that in that audience that night. So I know it's uh, I've seen it replayed on Channel 17 a, a couple of times, and uh, and I know um, your parents and your uh, your dad, the firefighter for Spanish Fork, right, Carlson. I know there's a lot of proud uh, people out there that have known you around the community and, and watched that, and we couldn't be prouder of you as well. So great tradition of, of great attendance and, uh, and royalty that have just done great things in Spanish Fork. And so uh, big, big, I would say shoes, but big hills to fill. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you girls, uh, we can tell, are up to the task. So thank you. Thank you for being willing to serve. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Are we getting a picture while they're here, Chris? Uh, that's the other part that Nick usually does. You, you might want to have a camera. If you guys want to come up right here, yep. You got your flip phone? He's got his flip phone. <laughs> we'll have Jennifer take it. Oh, yeah, yeah Jennifer. Jennifer can do it. There you go. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. Okay. Just going to do like this. One, two, three. This is the, I'm the backup. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Okay, very good. That takes us to uh, public comments, uh, the section of uh, public comments. Uh, before we uh, open it up uh, to the public to address the mayor and council for anything that you want to talk to us about that maybe not on the agenda, we have a special guest with us tonight. I think this is two meetings in a row. Is that is that correct, uh, Lana? These, I mean, you were here just not too long ago. Oh, okay, a month ago. Um, so first, uh, we'd, we'll ask you to come up and present uh, your item, if you could. And this is uh, this is a very neat partnership uh, that uh, that is very cool in our community. Yeah, who knew we'd be emailed the next week and asked to come to city you council should, again. You shouldn't so. have done that good. You know? <laughs> oh, so we're actually representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, our new calling is on the communications council and specifically government relations. And so um, every from Springville south to Delta, actually, but mainly Springville, Mapleton, and Spanish Fork. So what we were asked to do is talk to you a little bit about Tabitha's Way and the, the light of the world giving machines, first off. And I'm so thrilled to see Lily in here. So we'll have her come up at the end. But i um, so excited to have her here. So this year, the theme was Let Your Light So Shine. And really, that's because the Savior, when he spoke to his followers, he talked, that's the words he used, Let Your Light So Shine. 
And this is a great way to spread the light. So the giving machines actually started in 2017. And at that time, there was only 1.5 million that, um, well, actually now there's been 1.5 million since 2017. And over $22 million have been raised with this initiative. Um, so we'll go ahead and start here. So in Utah County, we're pretty thrilled about this because more dollars were given this year than any other year previously. We had 1.4 million given. The next previous was before COVID and it was 1.3. So we, we beat that. And the Orem South County giving machine surpassed Salt Lake and they don't want anybody to know that, but, <laughs> we, but we know that, that yeah. we surpassed awesome. them. And 100% of these donations go to the actual charity that people donate to. So the LDS Church actually covers all the administration costs of that. Um, some of the different nonprofits that were in the giving machines, Tabitha's Way, of course, we cheer very loud for Tabitha's Way here, but you can read the others there, Community Action, United Way, Show Up Care Pack for Teachers, Family Haven, Centro Hispano, Ra, The Refuge, Utah Boys and Girls Club, and of course, the global charities are the most popular, goats and chickens. Did anybody here donate for goats and chickens? There we go. Goats. Yeah, that's <laughs> always the most popular. Let's go ahead. And this was just a shot I took of a, a gal that had gone up the night of the opening. Um, the school supplies and backpacks, you could buy those for $10.00. In this area, we raised 27,000 plus. Fresh produce for kids that you could buy for $25 a month, we raised over 53,000. And then one month of meals for veterans, $40, and we raised $58,000. So we were pretty excited about how much we raised there. <gasps> Do any of those look familiar? You might know some of those people. They were actually at the giving event the the kickoff and we were pretty excited to see those so i was snapping pictures so that was kind of fun right here in our area spanish fork and next we're, we thought we'd just mention the feed utah program because that just happened and bruce is going to go ahead and take that i'm not sure about this um standing next to my wife and after these beautiful ladies i feel like the thorn in the room you know <laughs> Let me just uh, briefly talk about this Feed Utah. Um, a month ago, March 16th, uh, faith-based congregations and um, individuals and organizations gathered together and went forth and, and did this Feed Utah to, to stop hunger in, in Utah. This is the third time in the state of Utah that this has happened. It's become very important to reestablish or, or refulfill the, uh, the pantries throughout the state of Utah. And so just to report on that, just a quick minute, if we could just pull this up. Um, these are the people that basically participated. It was for the Utah Food Bank, Macy's Stores, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And like Lana mentioned, we're part of the Mount Nebo Communications Council. And so what happened on our end is we made sure all the door hangers went out through the stakes and Relief Society presidents to everybody in the community. And so once they were all established and all the door hangers were out, then the, the collection process took place from there. And uh, I thought it went really well. Uh, there's always room for improvement when you're dealing with the volunteer army in terms of the distribution and the collection process. But nevertheless, this is what we did here. If you can hit that one more time. Um, nevertheless, there's over 98,000 pounds of food collected in that day. And uh, it was distributed throughout Macy's at 36,710 pounds, uh, Santa Quinn Macy's 21,000, and then Tabitha's Way, almost 40,000 pounds of food was collected all in that one day. Valiant effort, something that is, is important because even in Spanish Fork, we have those that, that probably go to bed hungry at night. And um, we want to do all we can to mitigate that because we're so blessed. Nobody should really go to bed hungry in this area. So that's our report. Thanks so much. Let's Appreciate it. Lillian. Oh. Lillian, if you'll come up. If you noticed, the slide before had Lillian and her husband Sterling Kump's photos. 
Lillian really runs um, this area. Uh, Wendy Osborne started it, but Lillian does the big lift, was in my office often. We were working out delivering meals, and it, you guys are amazing. I think the reason, I, I'm trying to decide why they didn't have you guys present, but I think it's because you're so great, and everyone needs to know how great you are, and you can't say that yourself. So, <laughs> I, you know, this wouldn't have happened without Tabitha's way. So it's all, all about you. And I don't know if you want to say anything oh, now, well, but sorry. <laughs> she gets me all teary-eyed. So, yeah, no pressure. Uh, no, we are just so incredibly thankful that we have this partnership, um, not only with organizations like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but with our, all of our, our local cities. Um, we are here to help the residents of the area in our community. And like they said, like the Feed Utah Food Drive, we are now we have 98,000 pounds of food that was collected to help people in this area. And it was by far the largest year that we have ever received, which just goes to show that you know people in this community care about those who need help and we can't do it without uh, the efforts of everyone in our area so thank you last slide if we could that just has some photos of um, go the other way it just has some photos of the volunteers the, at Macy's and some of the, the work effort that went on and Emma Williams Thank you for having that as your initiative. That's going to be awesome. This is such a great group to, to work with. So. Thank you. Any Thank questions you. for the Hiskies or Lillian about this? Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. Thank you. Okay, one, two, three. Well, the Hiskies are here. I've, I've got to embarrass them just a little bit in case they have to go somewhere else. I know they're busy people, or maybe you'll stay. You, you about stayed the whole meeting last time, and I, I don't know when you went to bed. But uh, um, great, great people that I had the opportunity to get to know uh, at, in my teenage years as I moved from uh, Palmyra up to the mouth of the canyon, and, and they were my neighbors up there, and, uh, and they've never stopped service. I, I, from the beginning, knew them as, as service people, and so it's no wonder that they, they both retire from professions and get put into probably a busier, busier type of work than they've ever been in, but uh, just people that, uh, that in at my age, and, and, and I think you, you young people uh, can, can relate to this of how important the people you can point out that come meet you in your space, meet you on your level. Um, and and that, was, that was the Hiskies. Uh, I felt like I had some friends in school in different places, but not a lot of friends in, in, a, in a, seemed like uh, in a church space or something, but, but Bruce met me on the golf course. That's where that's where that's where we went. And yeah, he's got his master's tie on. I see, he's still a golfer. Uh, but uh, but that's he taught me a lot of life lessons, and I attribute a lot of things to learning from him. And it it was because he was willing to meet me in in my space. So thank you publicly. Thank you. So so he chased you off the golf course. <laughs> no, he, he uh -huh. said he said I hear I hear a decent golfer, and um, I don't think it's. I don't think you should lie about your score. So let me see. You know, it was basically. There you go. That's, so, that's okay. Yeah, he came I, and there kept had score. To be a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, it was good times. Okay, uh, we'll we'll go back to uh, uh, public comments. If there's anybody from the public that uh, is not here for uh, something that we've got a couple public hearings tonight later on in the agenda. If you're not here for those, uh, this is any general comment that you could come up and speak to the mayor and council. Uh, about something or ask questions, uh, this is, is your time. So anybody who would like to come up, try to keep it to three minutes. We'd love to hear from you. Zane, are you walking in for that? Or are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, 
We'll we'll, uh, we'll go to council comments. Uh, we'll start. Uh, which end should we start on? Which did we do last time? Now I'm forgetting. We'll start in the middle. Uh, Councilman Cardin. All right. Councilman Cardin, and then we'll go that way. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple of things to report on. Um, just want to put out that reminder because for our net before our next meeting, the Youth Arts Festival registration will be open on May first. So those schedules should be coming out, I believe, this week. Um, but May first, that um, will be happening for uh, registering for that. But then uh, one of the boards I get to sit on is the airport board. Um, and a couple things I just wanted to to discuss. I get to sit on there with uh, Councilwoman Beck. And this last or the first quarter of this year, we had 22,000 operations on our airport. Um, you may think like on a Saturday that there's a lot of airplanes going in and out of that airport. And you're right. There are a lot of airplanes going in and out of that airport. Um, one of the things that's on our consent items tonight, um, this wanted to bring up is that they're getting ready to do a seal project at the airport where they're going to seal all of the pavement. Um, one of the cool things about that is that we were able to get a grant for that, and UDOT is covering 90% of that um, cost, and the city only covers 10% of that cost. Um, it's a big deal, and um, our airport manager, Christian, is doing a really good job of trying to make sure our airport is a viable and uh, a driver for the, for the area. Um, just another one little update just for the council to know is that they are working on getting a new parking lot with ga gate access, which will help keep some security down there, which will be nice. Um, for the residents there. One other cool fact, um, not to belabor it too long, is last board meeting we had a doctor who wants to put a hang he has a hangar, so he has airplanes in it, but he's going to do flight physicals at our airport. Apparently, if you're a pilot, you have to get a physical uh, yearly, and we have a need for that in this area because there's only one doctor apparently that does it, and so one's coming to Spanish Fork. It's pretty cool. Um, in the air? Or they do it on they, the ground? They do it up in the air. Just make sure you're good up there. No. They do it in the hangar and just make sure you're good. And they have to do like EKGs and some other stuff. It's pretty cool. But that's all I have, Mayor. Perfect. Thank you, Councilman Cardin. Councilman Took. All right. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so last week uh, was the MVP Sports Grand Opening. New location. So if you remember them, if you've grown up here or have ever visited, visited the location just on Main Street, they just moved north a couple blocks and around the corner. So it was exciting to see them open their doors again. Fun to be a part of that event. That was actually the the first um, appearance for the new Miss Spanish Fork Royalty, and so it was fun to be there with them and to support MVP Sports. Uh, Kathleen Levitt, our president of the, the Chamber of Commerce, is unable to make it tonight, so I've got a couple announcements I'd like to read from her, so some th upcoming events that we want you to be aware of. Uh, we have, uh, on April 18th here in two days, is the new networking event uh, at the Veterans Center. Jersey Mike's is catering, and there will be uh, networking and learning on how to use the chamber for business benefits. So it'll be a really great event. Then on April 30th from 2 to 6 p.m. we have a job fair for, at, excuse me, the job fair will be located at uh, ALC. Uh, there'll be, there's booth spaces that are still available and there'll be free education classes and prizes for job seekers. So if you have questions about any of these things this evening, let me know, please. But that's going to be a good one on the 30th job fair. And then the Rotary uh, slash Chamber of Commerce Golf uh, Scholarship uh, will be held on May 8th. Um, scholarship applications for this are being renewed this week. This uh, strikes a chord with me. I was a, a recipient many years ago of a ro Rotary Scholarship that helped me get to college. So this is a, an important big event coming up on May 8th. And then lastly, we have the Battle of the Forks Pickleball Tournament against American Fork on May 18th. Um, There'll be a qualifier on May 11th. So if that's something that you'd like to participate in, just reach out. Um, let's see. I'm excited to also sort of announce, I, I know Dell stepped out, Parks and Rec, this last week they moved into their new location, which is just across the street from us here, the old library. So now the Parks and Rec Recreation Department in the city is, is housed there, which is a, an exciting, good move for them, and uh, we couldn't be happier about that. Uh, last thing from me this week and I think I have a couple pictures that we might be able to show, something kind of special. So a couple of nights back, maybe it was last week, a couple nights ago, anyway, I was able to attend Spanish Fork 101's evening with the Fire and EMS uh, teams at Station 62. Uh, I was lucky, lucky to be in the first cohort of Spanish Fork 101 with a couple folks on this stage here. I know Jesse and Councilman, yeah, anyway, a couple of us. But uh, it, I missed the, the year that I participated in that class. I missed that evening with the, the firefighters and our EMS. And I, I've wanted to go 
learn about them. And so I had the chance to do it, and um, it was absolutely fantastic. And so if we can't get the pictures, that's okay. But if um, anyway, tr take my word for it. it. Do Spanish Fork 101. You get to get a peek behind the curtain of, of Spanish Fork City, of all the amazing things that, that we do that make our city absolutely incredible. And I, I loved catching up with that one evening that I missed. Uh, and, and that's all I've got, Mayor. Perfect. Thank you, Councilman Took. Councilman Marshall. I'll make it easy tonight. I don't have anything. It does make it no, easy. That's pretty quick. Huh? Okay. You're y yielding your time. I, actually, to... I'll, give it, I'll give all the rest of it to okay. Stacey. Right. Um, just one thing. Um, I'm on the Veterans Council, and I can't seem to find um, when that occurs. So if anyone out there knows when that's happening, please reach out to me and say, could you show up? Um, I just I can't find it anywhere. So please. Maybe ask Councilman Argyle. I, I did. Is he the one that used to be on it? He yeah. gave me some names, but I don't. Oh. I need to follow up with those guys. I don't have their numbers. So Somebody. anyone knows, please let me know. I'd love to attend, but I'm struggling. I think their meetings did start to span out a little it's, it's, further it's, than what they were. Yeah, it's like quarterly, sometimes twice a year. So Same. anyway, please. We're on the hunt. There's, there's Councilman Marshall's public plea. Somebody find when the meeting's at. It was either that or traffic, and I couldn't decide which one to talk <laughs> okay. about. Okay, all right, perfect. Councilwoman Beck. Um, on April 6th, I was able to go over to the rodeo grounds and do the live interviews for the 2024 Fiesta Days Rodeo Royalty. It was really fun to interview five articulate, sharp, knowledgeable young women. Um, and they announced, they chose the winners, and we, the queen is Dally Holyoke. She's from St. George. First attendant is Riley Warnock. And the second attendant is Tara Hicken. And our 2023 Rodeo Queen is now Miss Rodeo Wyoming. And so she has a big role to fill up there. So just really talented young women, which I'm excited to see what they do. And they're going to have a really busy summer. And then speaking of Fiesta Days, I believe all of our vendor booths in the park are filled up and we have about 10 or 15 spots left in the Grand Parade. So you need to get your get online, SpanishFork.org, um, or SF, SF Fiesta Days, and get your application filled out for the Grand Parade. And we are also still in need of sponsors for the Pyro Musical. Everybody loves that event. If you're interested in some sponsorships, you can also go to SF Fiesta Days, and there is an application there, and it can give you all of the, all of the details, what the benefits are for, for helping sponsor that. And that is all I have. Perfect. Thank you, Councilwoman Beck. Councilman Euler. Thank you, Mayor. I just have two things to go over. Last night, we met as the RAP Tax Committee for the first time this year to, to review the grant applications. We had... 12 applicants that requested about $100,000 um, worth of wrap tax for different projects. Some of the applicants ranged from the Little Miss Spanish Fork pageant, the Youth Arts Festival, the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers, and I can say that we weren't able to fund every request that was made, but we will be able to fund most of that. So pretty exciting, a lot of the things that we're able to do with that wrap tax. <clears throat> Second thing, also last night, we had our very first Historic Preservation Commission lecture series right here in the Heritage Room next door. We had Clay Nelson and Jim Jensen, who came and spoke on the history of the Utah State Junior Livestock Show. And I can't think of a better way to kick off our lecture series than by talking about something that has taken place for 100 years going into the second hundred years. And so I'm not going to say a lot about it because I know we've got some people here tonight that are going to speak on this a little bit later. So I will do want to mention one of the things that Clay and Jim both emphasized when it comes to the, the Junior Livestock Show is that it's not about raising and selling animals. It's about raising good kids who become great leaders in our community. And I thought that was... That was important that they shared that and, and, and appreciated it. Our next lecture, 
you can mark your calendars now, will be May 20th, 7 p.m., and this one will be on the history of the Spanish Fork High School, and we've got Coach Jim Nelson who's going to come and speak on that. We all know that we're getting a new high school, and this is the last year for the current one. It'll be demolished here in June, and so come and learn a little bit more from Coach Shu about the history of the Spanish Fork High School. Thanks, Mayor. Perfect. Thank you, Councilman Oyler. Appreciate all the, the work that the council does uh, between meetings and, uh, and the committees that they serve on. It, uh, it helps uh, to keep us connected to what's going on and, and report back uh, to, to, to what we're doing as well. Uh, uh, it's touched on a, a little bit, but I appreciate uh, the people in attendance tonight. Uh, tonight is kind of uh, ag night, if you will, at, uh, in Spanish Fork. Uh, and so we're, we're happy to have uh, a lot of familiar faces uh, in, in our audience tonight and, uh, and discuss really such a, a super important piece of, of Spanish Fork's identity and in, in the surrounding areas, including all of South Utah County. So uh, we have some guests here. I think we have uh, Mr. Hatfield from uh, Utah State University. Here you are. Sorry, I didn't know what you looked like. I could have Googled you and found uh, that I, I was hoping you were here, uh, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us uh, at council meeting tonight, and uh, I'll pass it over to you for a, a presentation. Okay. Now I'll make this a little bit short and sweet. Um, my name is Jake Hadfield. I work with Utah State University Extension, and I work as the Utah County Ag and Natural Resources agent or Ag and Natural Resource faculty here. Now, why I'm here tonight is I actually am here to help present an award. I think, Mayor, you may have some comments about it, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of wanted to inform the council as well as everyone who's here about this award because I think it is a very, very prestigious award designation. Um, so the award designation is known as the Century Farm Award, which is awarded by the Utah Farm Bureau. This award is given to a family that has owned farmland for a hundred years and that it has stayed within that same family. They have to show not only deeds for land, but also have to show the lineage and how that farm was passed on. And tonight we're lucky enough, and I might let you introduce them, Mayor, but you'll see over here we've got our sign. It's hidden kind of in the back for the Utah Century Farm Award. Um, but we are excited that we have a family here. Um, one of the things to know in the past in Utah County, I handle all the applications here. We used to get many applications come in. That number has gotten fewer and fewer throughout the years just because of the changing dynamics that we face in our county and the different things that have happened just throughout the years for agriculture. And so with that, Mayor, I think I'll let you introduce them if that's okay. Perfect. That'd be yep. great. Okay, perfect. I'm going to read a little bit of a, of a, of a bio of uh, who Mr. Hatfield will present this important award to. And again, the distinction that I, I want to make sure is, is part of um, all of the public, uh, whether you're, you're, you're watching this and, and living within city limits or, or in the surrounding uh, farm uh, agricultural areas of South Utah County or, or cities uh, that, that, uh, that rest on our borders. This is an important part of, uh, of who we are in, in Spanish Fork, and it always, it always has been, and it always will be uh, for what uh, Councilman Oilers uh, already touched on as well. So let me read this really quick. The parcel of land known today as the Evans Family Farm, all started with great-great-grandfather David Losey Huff. He had 10 children with his wife Amelia, seven sons and three daughters. He purchased a large piece of land in Lakeshore and subdivided out the land so each one of his children could have a parcel of land. The area of land was nicknamed Huffville since there was so many Huff family members that lived in that area. Jane Huff was one of the younger daughters of David Losey and Amelia Huff. She married David James Evans. They worked on the farm together until his death in 1934. This left Jane to manage the farm alongside her son, Floyd Huff Evans. He continued to farm the parcel of land until his later years in life. Floyd's health declined in the late 1980s and his son, James Evans, took over the management of the farm. Floyd passed away in 1998. This farm is still managed by James Evans. Many other family members are there to help around the farm, including his brother Dave Evans, along with his sons, daughters, and grandkids. The Evans farm is the last parcel of land that was started by David Huff. The farm holds many generations of memories of hard work, difficulties, 
and uncertainty and a lot of enjoyable times. The farm raises cows, horses, and a few chickens and a lot of tractors and trailers. With over 100 years of continuous operation, our family stewardship has been to maintain the land while raising livestock and kids for more than a century. It's my distinct honor as the mayor of Spanish Fork to uh, recognize a great family, uh, a, a great uh, school teacher also in our community for, for decades and decades, uh, the Evans family, specifically, I call him Jim Evans, but it, James Evans and the whole Evans family. Please uh, come up and, and receive your award and, and our well-due applause. picture first and then we'll have you speak. We hope you prepared about 30 minutes. Is that how much you did, Jim? <laughs> Mr. Hatfield, stand right next to him. Yeah, you we call want him you Jim, too. but since, since sixth grade, I call him Mr. Mr. Evans. Yeah, you better. You better. <laughs> you better. Okay, one, two, three. We want to hear from you, but, you, but all, of, all of TV land wants to hear from you too, Mr. Evans. Well, the first question, and there, there's probably a few of them up here, but how many years did you teach and who was your favorite student? Uh, well, the favorite student was definitely you. Okay. And all right. Euler, <laughs> okay. unless he had. Uh, 31 years. 31 years, yeah. Uh, 30 in Nebo School District, one year up in the uh, uh, you and the area. Uh, yeah, when uh, D Brother Euler mentioned that uh, agriculture is about cows and kids, we, we have this uh, hoodie <laughs> that I keep out, give out every year like for Christmas, and, and that's really what it's all about. It's uh, the, the cows, that we, we, more, that's what most of what we raise, but the, the kids is the most important part. And you can see uh, the first five, about the first five or six rows there is all all our kids and in-laws and outlaws and my siblings <laughs> over here, and, and that they they show up all the time to help me. And, you know, I need a hand, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so when I got something to do, I I have to ask them guys. I, mean, I really really appreciate all the help that they do give me, and and uh, uh, yeah, it all started out with the Huffs, and uh, down there in that uh, northwest corner. By the uh, mouth of the river and all up through there, and uh, and and they, back in the day it was every house was a huff, uh, huff from the David Losey, and uh, now there's none, <laughs> no huffs. But anyway, uh, it's it's good to have that heritage and and appreciate that and appreciate all my kids and grandkids and siblings and so. On. So this uh, this sign gets uh, gets hung out uh, uh, someplace that you choose on on your property. Is that right? So so people driving by can driving can recognize by, right, this. Is uh, as you're making that big bend on uh, four four thousand south in Lake Shore, northern Lake Shore, it'll be the first lane on the left. It'll be a, a, right by that uh, cement ditch, and it's there. You'll notice it. it there's that big house about the size of this library that they're building there, just the neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> just go past it, <coughs> past it and look at this, <laughs> this sign here. Okay. Anyway. Okay. And, and, and so, so that's good directions for our residents that like to go out, take a drive <laughs> out to that area, get, get away. And, and it's probably, uh, if you're like some of the other uh, farmers that I know, uh, look, but don't touch. Right? You can drive by and see that sign, and and uh, and, and look at the beautiful farm field, and yeah. and uh, it's it's just a good yeah, good thing to do. Don't take the turn. Just keep going straight. <laughs> Any other questions for? I don't have a question, Mr. but a Evans. comment. It's and you couldn't see it, and maybe for, I don't know if the rest of the council saw it. But as mayor was reading that, you could see the family of the Evans family because the pride in their eyes. And the dedication and the stories, the blood, sweat, and tears that they put into that farm means the world to them. It may not at the moment because it was hard work, but 
the life lessons that have been taught and the pride that they have in this farm is incredible. So I don't know if Travis was able to, to zoom in there. I don't, I don't know, but he did. He says he's got a thumb up, so watch it on YouTube. But you'll see your family's pride that they have in you and what you've instilled in them. So thank you for what you've done. Well, thank you. Yeah. What did you teach at, uh, I at, taught, at school? I uh, taught mostly math and science. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had sixth and seventh graders. Right when they traded, uh, they left the middle school. Went, they split them up again. Mm-hmm. That's about the time that I left. And uh, usually sixth grade, um, yeah, no, yeah, sixth grade science, seventh grade math. Mm-hmm. I was actually I was supposed to be a PE and math teacher. They got you know they get you into that science. And stuff. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like that the best. Oh. I, I always had little animals in there for the kids to play with. And, just remember how cold your class was because we were out in the trailer. Oh, we were using the trailer. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was. Good times. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, oh, go ahead. So when we walked in today, I look out and there's a whole bunch of people here. I'm like, what in the world is on the agenda? <laughs> and, and what time do I need to leave before they all come up? Um, and then, But now I'm. You know, like putting the dots together, I'm like Evans and Evans and Evans and Evans. You and, all look alike. Ah, yeah. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. So all we need to do to get people to come out is one of these things, right? Yep. Is just invite one Evans, yep. and you get 60 people. That's right. Yeah, um, they're all real good looking and handsome and everything. They, they take after my wife. <laughs> they do get that from your wife. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. It's it's just okay. impressive the support that Mr. Evans has gotten. Um, it is blood, sweat, and tears. Um, we off, these guys make fun of me that I could never be a farmer, and, and they're not wrong. Um, but this heritage is important to Spanish Fork City, absolutely. And I think there are times when um, we may send the signal from up here that farming isn't important um, because we are developing, we are growing, but that is not the case. Farming is extremely important to us. It's extremely important to our city, our heritage. Um, and I think I could... I think all of us share this. Keep doing it. Keep doing it for as long as you want. We want you to do that. We don't want to get in your way to do that. We want farming to be part of this community. And so keep it up. There are a lot of folks in here that can keep that heritage going. Um, and so please do. It's, it's super important um, just to love the land and, and what you give back to our community. We want you here. And thank you for doing well, it. Thank you. I. Uh yeah, the uh, livestock show. I used to do a little bit of that also, and uh, uh, I noticed when I was the father of it and my kids, uh, it's not for. The, it seems like the the, da- the the dad's doing a lot of the work and the mom and all that, but it, it's for the kids. It's not. Uh, I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I had I, I had one daughter. We had a whole group of pigs and they that sound pigs that time and then she come out the day before and says now which one's my pig <laughs> <laughs> that bit and that, yeah that was, somebody just went like this yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i don't know who that was so i'm curious just with those that are in the room how many of you yourselves or have kids that are showing in the junior livestock show this year special hands oh yeah my kids. so I, I didn't mention it but may 2nd so the community is aware. It's always the very first Saturday in May is when the sale, and then it starts just a few days before that. So right. anybody in the community that wants to come down and celebrate these kids and the hard work that they put in, come down to the fairgrounds May 2nd, May 1st, those few days before, and, and look and see the work that they put into to raising these animals and showing them. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool thing for these kids. Like Shane says, it's not easy doing what you do, oh, okay. but we appreciate you. Well, we need you. And, and, and it shouldn't be overstated either. The, the, the economic piece of what you do as a, as a farmer and a rancher out there, um, uh, IFA has been here for a long time. Leland Mills has been here for a long time. Cal Ranch, relatively new. And, and all these places that, uh, that cater to, hey, uh, you know, there's livestock, there's, there's crops, there's things being grown, and kids as well out there uh, is, is because of, of your, your way of life. And so when something cool like this happens, uh, we certainly want to be on the, on the end of celebrating it with you, your family, and recognizing that contribution because um, it, uh, 
it is it is something that that should be recognized and uh, and you should be applauded for it. So, Thank you. family effort and good people, good man. Uh, and and good good kids, good grandkids, and probably great grandkids. Now, are you down to great grandkids? We got great. Oh my gosh! <laughs> good, yeah. I yeah. probably got did I hear? Yeah, one of them. Probably All right, for sure. Good, right there. There's there's the next hundred years, right there. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Anyway, well, I really appreciate these guys. I I didn't think they'd have that. I'd have that much support, but I appreciate that. Yeah. So. And, uh, I see him, a lot of them every Sunday, so over home, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I wanted to mention that I got an apartment for rent in Salem. For the, oh, they left. For somebody that would, it was needing a place? Yeah. For, uh, the Miss uh, I was going to invite those uh, queens and their tenants. Oh, oh okay. Over, all right. All right. There you go. Oh, yeah, there you go. There's the Jim Evans we know. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Congratulations, Evans family. Appreciate you. Very good. Very good. Very fun to do. Okay, uh, we're not done with Ag Night in, in Spanish Fork. Uh, we've, uh, we've got Lisa Olson, and uh, I see some members from, uh, from the uh, uh, livestock, uh, the state livestock auction show uh, that are here in attendance and we want them to come up and uh, brief us on what's coming up this uh, this now what are we two are we two weeks away uh, two weeks away from uh, bringing uh, a, a bunch of kids from all around the state and their projects <laughs> to Spanish Fork we call them projects right Yep. Okay. Yep. They are projects. Okay. Yes, my name is Lisa Olson. I grew up here in Spanish Fork, and I am a product of the Utah State Junior Livestock Show, and I, now I'm here representing the Utah State Junior Livestock Show um, as helping on the committee for the 100-year celebration and ongoing committee as my husband and I are both the treasurers for the for the Utah State Junior Livestock Show. They let your husband, the accountant, count the money? Are we sure? Crazy, huh? Okay. A little frightening. I know where they went to school. <laughs> so just a little bit of um, history on my side of the where I come from through the Utah State Junior Livestock Show. Um, I am a fourth generation of this program. My grandfather was a part of this program. My father, I'm a third, sorry. I'm the third, and then my children are the fourth. And we only, out of our five children, all five have come through, and we have one left. He has this year and next year, and then he'll be aged out as well. But each one of them still continue to plan on being at the Utah State Junior Livestock Show. And, of course, we put them to work. <laughs> so that's our vision of this, and always has been, in developing youth through a project that's teaching them hard work, responsibility, and giving back. And so that's a lot of our focus this year, the 100 year. Um, my grandfather, Ben Roach, was actually the show manager of the 50 year celebration of the Utah State Junior Livestock Show. And I even ran around with Riff Raff like our chief of police <laughs> at the Utah State Junior Livestock Show, who his father was very deeply involved, and he came through the program. So no wonder you have such a great chief to lead this city. Did he so, actually show up during those days? Because I think he's just skipping school. Uh, yeah, he was there, of course, because okay. he could skip school. <laughs> I'm guessing maybe you did a little bit, maybe <laughs> Mr. Euler a little bit. Skip school, know. but not for the fair. All right, all <laughs> not right. Not for the show. <laughs> so... Not only did I have family here in Spanish Fork that's deeply rooted in this program, but my mother's side, who is from the Summit County, they came every year. So my mother also participated and showed here. And so I have it on both sides, and I think it's a great honor, um, not only for the city, but also all of those who have participated outside throughout this whole state to come here to showcase and all of their hard work throughout the state for 100 years has been phenomenal. So with that, I'm also going to introduce a couple of youth that we have here, and then I'll wrap it up after them. But if I could have uh, James. Do you want to come up first, buddy? This is James Jarvis. We might need to steal a chair. No, nope, he's taller than I thought. Yep, okay, got it. Got it, dude. So... 
Let me help my thing here. So, as you know, my name is James Jarvis, and I'm 11. I go to Brockbank Elementary, and I'm in the Palomire 4-H. I am also fourth generation. Uh, my dad showed who's Chuck Jarvis. My grandpa showed who's uh, Matt Jarvis. And my great-grandpa showed who is Lee Jarvis. Um, I want to start off with a funny story. Uh, my first year of showing was I had this uh, lamb, and I named her Crazy Alice from John Wayne and the Cowboys uh, because he had this horse, and she was nuts, so, and my lamb was nuts. So I thought it would be a good name. So one day I was showing her, and I was doing my stance, and she slid under my legs, and I fell onto her back, and I was mutt and busting her all the way down my field. And then when I got off, I thought, Man, I wish I did that at the Fiesta days. I would have won it. But, so, yeah. But, so, a memory that will always be in my mind of, like, you know, the, uh, you know, stock show. Sorry. I had to break apart. Um, so, it was my Palmyra 4-H memory because it was the first time I ever showed, like, in public, and... I was freaking out, maybe as scared as I am right now, but I won it, and I was like, beginner's luck, I guess, and it will always be in my mind, not because of me winning it, but because of, like, it was my first time showing, and it, it was really fun. Um, one of the hardest parts about showing sheep is showmanship, because it's hard, like, it's hard mentally, because you got to think where the judge is, and you have to make sure you're not covering any part of the lamb, and you got to make sure you can keep it under control. But I like to think of it as like a hard, like a easy hard challenge, and it's fun challenge there. Um, some other fun memories are like I feel like every time the little pen before you go in and show is like so fun because I made like five friends by just like in there talking and saying good luck and like hope like good luck and you know are you scared because I'm scared and stuff like that <laughs> um I also like going to like the dances with my friends or like going to the uh barm the ice cream place and it's really fun but and it's like crazy to think that maybe like my great great grandkids could be like showing at the 200th year anniversary and it's really cool to think that, and I'm so thankful that I could come up here and talk about this, and bye. Yeah. Thank well you, done, James. James. Thanks, James. That was awesome. You did great. So next, we wanted to uh, bring on one of our graduating seniors this year. And uh, so if Tanner Hawks could come up and tell us a little bit about him and where he's come. We've had a, a junior starting out and now up to a senior. Yeah, so my name's Tanner Hawks. I'm a senior at Maple Mountain High School. Um, I'm part of the Maple Mountain FFA and it's also part of the Leland 4-H stock show stuff. Um, I'm also a fourth generation showman. Um, started with my great grandpa, Glenn Larson. Um, he started showing in the early 1930s and um, later went on to the um, serve in the committee for this stock show and also to serve as president for the stock show. Um, and then his son, my grandpa Rex Larson, um, showed from the 1960s to 70s and he also served on the committee. Um, and then his children all served, my aunts and uncles and mom. And um, his son Ryan won the grand champion steer in um, 1995. And so we've had a lot of fun with um, that. And one of my favorite memories of the stock show is um, like. Um, like he was saying, kind of the first time going. And um, I also won a showmanship the very first time I ever went, which is, again, kind of beginner's luck. But it was a lot of fun. And um, for me, it was kind of like, wow, like all this work that I put into it, it finally paid off to something. Like I get a cool little buckle. And um, <laughs> the hours and the days that spent working with that steer, and um, it, it was a lot. And it becomes to be like a pet. And so it's, it's honestly a lot of fun. Um, there's also like it's just a party family and friends and cousins and everyone gets together and like he was saying there's dances and um it's just a lot of fun to go and hang out um, one of the main lessons that i've learned from the stock show over the years is patience because <laughs> the steers don't really want to work with you ever 
And so to get them to kind of trust you and to be their, like, be your friend kind of like takes a lot of work and a lot of patience. And that's not something that I came by, honestly, but that's something that I definitely have been able to learn and to apply to my own life now. Um, the patience of waiting and of putting in the work that I need to do um, and then waiting for the reward. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I'm grateful that I was able to talk to you guys about it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, yeah. Tanner. Yeah. Thank you, Tanner. You did a great job. All right, so those are the kind of youth that are in our program, and we're excited to continue this as long as we can. And, um, and it's come from a lot of hard work and dedication from amazing people. And I can say that that's one of the main things that I have gained through coming through this program is the relationships. Um, the mentors that I had in this and that I can now give back to these kids um, in some way that will help shape their lives. And that's what we want is for these kids to come through the program, leave the program with skills that they can use to better their life and come back and give, give back, serve, bring their kids back, whatever it may be, but they're always welcome back. Um, and we have a lot of kids that, that are not, you know, for, fourth generational, even FFA kids that are starting as ninth graders, their parents have no clue what this is. It's just a huge opportunity for these, where we're at now, it's not, agriculture is fewer and fewer and fewer, right? So it's giving a lot of kids opportunities that, um, that aren't available in families, some families anymore. Um, but to go forward with what we're doing this year and what's coming up, we uh, started a scholarship, legacy scholarship, for the first year, and we've had a great feedback on that. We had a banquet a couple of weeks ago to start raising some money for that. So graduating seniors like Tanner can apply for that scholarship. We're hoping to give out um, at least $10,000, $1,000 scholarships, if not more. We're hoping the kids will apply. So if you're showing at the Livestock Show, and you're a graduating senior, we need your application by Saturday, April 20th. Um, so that's really a great addition for the show moving forward. Uh, we're also uh, partnering with Tabitha's Way and doing a food drive. And so we're asking for families to bring food to the show from all around the state. We want everyone to bring and participate. And we're hoping to exceed our goal of at least 1,800 pounds of food donated because then the Utah Farm Bureau, who is also helping us out with that, will match pound for pound up to 1,800 pounds of ground beef to give to Tabitha's Way. So that's a fun addition that we've never done in the past. Um, and then we would like to invite you city council members to come out on April 30th, that Tuesday. It's the first night and we will be holding our opening ceremonies. It's at 8 p.m. after we have all the animals weighed in, and we want to highlight these youth as they come, come in with their different counties and really make it kind of a big fun party to start off, kick off the, the whole event. So please join us if you can there. We're planning on, as of now, we have about 510 exhibitors entered and 955 animals. So it's gonna be a big show if they all show up. That's, that is higher, that's above what we were last year. So we're excited that we're growing. We're definitely not declining, we are growing. Uh, and then the last thing is uh, that our viewers at home may be also interested in. Um, besides coming down and seeing what we're all about, we would love to have everyone come. Uh, but on our, the sale day on Saturday, May 4th, the sale is at 10 a.m. And so anyone who wants to purchase an animal to put in their freezer, that's a great way to do it. Um, and you're supporting youth uh, in these projects. And anyone who also wants to just come and purchase an animal and then donate it to Tabitha's Way, they can also do that and um, donate back to that organization. So we're really excited and we're really grateful for the City of Spanish Fork for 100 years of partnering to make this show happen and just for your continued support and we're grateful to be here and to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go anywhere.
Don't go anywhere. I think some of us might yeah, we, have some questions. We've got questions, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. I've got a few. So I never showed as a kid, and I wish I had because I feel like I, I feel like I missed out after, after the lecture series last night and hearing some of the stories about pigs getting loose and almost running down Main Street and a few other things. I, it's the best way to raise a kid. <laughs> so a couple of questions for somebody that's wanting to learn a little more. First of all, what animals do they show? Great question. So we show uh, cattle. There's either market steers or breeding heifers, um, breeding cat like you can even bring your cow calf pair. Uh, and we have a couple of bulls entered. So we have breeding cattle and market steers or heifers. We also have the same in the sheep. We have market lambs and breeding ewes and rams. And in the goats, we have market goats as well as breeding does. And then we have our market hogs, uh, gilts and barrows both show at our market show. Awesome. So last night the mayor had mentioned to me that he'd got sifted and I didn't dare ask him what that meant. So what does it mean to get sifted? If your animal does not weigh, we have a minimum weight they have to weigh or that's usually the only reason for sifting unless it's a crazy animal and we can see that and it's going to be harmful for others. <laughs> but usually it's because they don't meet the weight requirements. If a youth brings an animal that doesn't meet the weight requirements, we still allow them to show in the fitting and showmanship division. So we have a market class and we have fitting and showmanship. So they get to show two times while they're there, but if that animal doesn't meet those uh, minimum requirements, then they still are able to show in fitting and showmanship. Awesome. Sure it's crazy or? Crazy no, it or didn't underweight. make weight. It yeah. didn't make weight, but. Didn't give enough oats. They let me, they let me show out at the Jarvis barn in Palmyra and that was probably just because I showed up. Um, and, and then those, talk a little bit more about that, those local 4-H clubs yeah. around here, right? They have shows, and then they kind of have their own shows. Yes, uh, and it's unique to this area. When you ask around the state, there's not many other counties that have what we have. But right now, locally, just in this south end, and it draws in a lot of the north end of Utah County also, I believe there's five um, local 4-H clubs. There's Leland, Lakeshore, Palmyra, Benjamin, West Mountain 4-H, oh, and then Timp 4-H started over on the north end. So those youth, it's kind of a practice go. They get to come the week before the big show, and as West Mountain calls it, their big little show, and uh, they get to participate just within their club, which is a great opportunity for the youth to see a little more reward for their work because it's not as big of a show. But they get to kind of get the jitters out before they come up here to the big time. So, awesome. You mentioned there are about 510 youth this year. Yeah. Sounds like the, the big achievement is to be grand champion. Correct. How many grand champions are there? Is it based on each category and, and how does how does somebody, how does an animal become the grand champion? Great. So, yes, there is a grand champion in each of those categories. So um, a market hog, all of the market shows, there's four market shows for beef, uh, sheep, goats, and hogs. So there's a grand champion and a reserve champion for each of those. Um, even in our hogs, we have a grand barrow and a grand gilt, and then and reserve barrow and reserve gilt, and then an overall. So the pigs... Because they don't have a breeding show, we have a couple of extra grands for them. Um, but then our breeding shows also have grand and reserve champions. But the breeding animals are not sold at the auction, just the market animals. Um, but each of them receive a buckle, and all of the kids receive premium money. Um, what was the second part of your question? I think you answered it. Just how does how does somebody become, or how does oh, somebody win the grand so, champion? Uh, that's all on confirmation of the animal and how the how you take care of them and by feeding and grooming animals that makes a big difference so genetics the kids are always looking when they're choosing their project their genetics and how uh, how balanced their structure it all matters and then the kids job is then to take that smaller animal feed it out to its potential and hope for a grand champion, that they're the right weight, the right look, the right size for that judge on that day. <laughs> and, and that judge isn't just 
pulling Councilman Marshall and saying, hey, come come look at some animals, because he wouldn't I know not. Right, how to do it. <laughs> but you pull judges, like I think the judge last year for the hogs uh, said he was from Oklahoma or something. Yeah, he was we from try to draw in the best judges out there. Uh, they come from all over the United States. Yeah. So they know what they're, they're looking for. That's, yep, yeah. they do. Yeah. So. Any other questions yeah. for Lisa? Okay, come on hey, down. I'll just tell you, yeah, and so uh, we can come down on uh, the, that first day of the 30th. Yep. Um, uh, people can come down, and really it's going that whole week. Different different yep. uh, animals are being shown that whole week, right? Yes, uh, almost nonstop, sale. morning to night, we'll be showing. And all of the shows are in the Big Willie Barn. Yeah. So, yep. You get down to the fairgrounds, you find a parking spot. Dale, I'm sure it's the funnest week of your staff down there to figure out <laughs> thousands of people and where to park them. And then animals uh, that are typically, you know, a rodeo arena, we confine them to the rodeo arena typically. But these are animals walking from yeah. pens to show pens to different places. And so it's kind of a crazy carnival down there for a few days, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's awesome. It's great to see all sizes of kids and what I always thought was awesome for our family because um, we had some kids that most of my kids were also involved in sports but this was one sport or one event that we did all together as a family everyone was there everyone participated sometimes they were competing against each other because seniors compete with juniors in the market class and in showmanship they're divided by the age of the kids but it was something that our family could do all together, we worked together in the barn. We were together there showing where when it was going to tennis or soccer or whatever, usually mom and dad showed up and maybe not all the family, but this was a family affair that, and still is, they all still come. There's still the local kids still uh, somewhat going around to, to booster, uh, the booster club going around and raising some money from local businesses to help boost the, the market price of animals sometimes. Is that just a you know, talk about that a little bit. Yes, uh, yes. I know we got Zane here. I've never seen you in a picture at all, Zane, buying a, an animal at all oh, from he, whatever bank. But he's very much a part of it. Yeah, we're yeah. grateful that Zane's there and and brings the boost money that he does to our sale. Um, but yes, the youth. Uh, a lot of times, the youth and their parents have found monies that they can help bring uh, to the sale, and we have a booster club that um, our committee chair is um, Tyler Mendenhall, and he's doing a great job of going around to different businesses and collecting some of that money so that we can boost kids not only from our little city here, but it, from all, the, all over the state. And we do a really good job because we travel to a lot of other shows throughout the state, and they're all great, but I feel like we do a really good job here of taking care of all of the kids that come to show. Again, I think it speaks to the livestock heritage of when when went to that dinner that you had the other night and raised a bunch of that money for your scholarship program. Uh, that was neat to flip through some of those books and see all the banks, all the businesses from from decades ago, and and some of those still today. Some of those have changed names, uh, but uh, but the the local support of of what this means to the community and to the kids and to the whole. Uh, livestock heritage is, is just really, really neat and cool to see supported during this time, too. So I agree. It's been, it's been amazing to see those um, individuals and businesses just year in and year out. They continually just keep giving and giving. And whether it's now through the scholarship program, we were blown away by the support of that. Um, you know, it's going to take more to continue that for boosting of animals. We we're really boosting these kids and helping them get a start. I know that it gave me a great start when I finished and was able to get out and start my life. So, yeah. very cool, very very neat thing. I'd invite again all of all of uh, citizens to to visit the the fairgrounds next week is uh, in the next couple of weeks as you guys get started and going. It's something to definitely learn from, even if you're not showing an animal, but uh, you, you get to learn about dedication from from families and, and kids uh, I'll never forget your your judge last year and it's been said at all these livestock uh, uh, events that we've had but uh, he said at the end and he said it with some emotion in his voice and his voice sounded a little bit more western than uh, than anything uh, was simply hey I can tell by this show that uh, you're not you're not raising projects you're raising kids and I know that's whether it's the hogs the steers or 
or sheep or, or whatever is being shown. So uh, great work. Um, and, uh, and I echo uh, what Mr. Uh, uh, what James said there. What a, what a good lesson to speak to somebody. Uh, hey, I'm scared. Are you scared? Yes, we're both scared. But, uh, but let's move forward and, and have a good time, and, and, uh, and this is the place to do it, is certainly the, the Utah State Junior Livestock Show in its 100th year. So we couldn't be and more proud. These kids, are their knowledge of their projects is amazing. So anybody that comes down to the show, just start talking to these kids, and they'll tell you all about it. So they want to share what they know and what they've learned. Yeah, this program is producing kids like Tanner and James. Like that's pretty impressive they just wander up here and just talk yeah. to us like they've been doing that their whole lives and the kids 11 and, and Tanner is a senior I mean you couldn't get me halfway up there when I was a senior in high school um, it's come a long ways from the 90s I mean you look at a two two guys that went through this in the 90s or three of you right here in the 90s thankfully it's come a long ways <laughs> um, and to, to produce to produce two gentlemen like that is pretty impressive um, great job tonight you two just you killed it uh, and Lisa you did as well and thank so you. I thank you for coming and it was it was impressive to see thank you thanks for okay. thank you. See, you. We'll see you down yes. there thank yeah, you Lisa for sure thank thanks you. Lisa another round of applause please for that. <laughs> okay very cool stuff I don't know that anything on the agenda is as fun as uh, what we just got to, to go through there so you're welcome. You're not going to offend us by uh, by needing to get somewhere else. Uh, but uh, this next thing is 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 really cool. If you're a Spanish Fork resident, the spring cleanup that's kind of important. This room is going to tip. It's probably going to tip just a little bit. <laughs> um, Mayor, I, Mayor. Yes. I I need to add a, an agenda item. Okay. Um, okay. Probably at the end of new business. Is that okay? End of new business. Yep. Okay. We All can right. do that. There's the whole Evans clan. That's awesome. I want. I mean, that's a good family. See ya. The funny thing, Shane, is I had the same question. I was like, "What did I miss?" <laughs> we, this doesn't happen very often. There's usually not this many people. And I'm like, "Where was Wade and Evan? Were they here?" Bit. Kristen. She gone. They're gone. You guys are gonna have to disperse to the other side. So it looks like we're. Yeah. I think they could have just had. They could have just two birds, one stone. I had a family reunion down here. <laughs> They're going to right they now. Might. They're going to do it right now. Okay. I think they just did. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now the fairgrounds. Very cool. Okay. Uh, so you want to add that when at the end of uh, uh, yeah. consent items? Um, account, no, at or? the end of new business. New business. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Mr. Chris Thompson for spring cleanup. All right. We are very excited about the new Drag Creek transfer station. Uh, by Nexa that's built North Main Street and it opens next week uh, on Wednesday. <clears throat> so the first time that, that the general public can go will be Thursday. It's Wednesday afternoon we have the grand opening and uh, it won't actually be open but we'll have a, some um, events going on uh, there. Uh, one of the things that we want to do to showcase this new transfer station which is State of the art, it's indoors, it's clean, uh, is for our spring cleanup this year. We are going, instead of having dumpsters at five different parks, we are going to give all of the residents three vouchers to go to the new transfer station to try it out, to see what a wonderful facility it is. Um, if you could go to the next. the arrow button. Try the space button, maybe. You're frozen. <laughs> That's it. Nick's not able to take vacations anymore. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Or conferences, one or the other. IT, IT. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All 
right. So uh, what you'll do is you'll go online to our screen cleanup website, which will open on Monday, this coming Monday, and uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to print on one page three vouchers. Uh, the vouchers will look like this, and uh, it's very similar to the green waste vouchers that we issue to the residents every year, except for it'll have this two-week voucher in blue at the top, and, and the words are a little bit different. It's only good for two weeks, uh, but you can bring uh, a, a load down to the transfer station any time that you want during that two-week period when it's open, uh, and and the, each voucher will be good for uh, a typical load, which we charge $10, $10 for. Now, if you bring a trailer with you or you have a very heavy load, um, they weigh it, and, and you will get a $10 credit towards that if, if you have more than a $10 load. And, and, and you, you're welcome to use multiple vouchers or, or, uh, or, or a voucher and pay some money as well for that. And so the other thing is, um, uh, since you are transporting your garbage across town, it's very important that you cover your load. Uh, we don't want any of that garbage flying off and littering our streets. And so uh, please make sure that, that you cover the load or else there's a $10 fee on top of that. And, and the vouchers don't cover that. So cover your load. Um, one thing I'd like to show you is where the transfer station is. You can see I-15 there. To the left of I-15, you have Main Street. And uh, up north of the airport, you'll see that yellow box. That is where the transfer station uh, is going to be located. And this is where the old transfer station was in orange here. And so not too far away from it, here's Main Street. So you'll just drive up Main Street to 3450 North and then turn left and come right in here. This is what the facility looks like. You'll drive down 3450 North. You'll skip the first entrance. This is entrance to the administrative offices and the parking lot there. Uh, you'll skip that entrance, but you'll come in here and you'll queue up one of these, these lines here. Come in, you'll get weighed uh, uh, under this cover here, and then you'll come in and you'll go through one of these doors right here. Inside, you'll back up, dump, and then you'll come out one of these doors here, and then come back through here. If, if you need to, you'll be weighed again if you have a really heavy load, and then you'll come out, and that's how you'll, you'll exit. Now, I, I want to give uh, uh, some of you young parents or parents of young children, a, a life hack here. Uh, in the transfer station, if you come in this first driveway here and you come and park, you go through the doors here, there is a room up here uh, on the second floor with glass windows. And, and you can bring your kids. When, when the garbage truck uh, came to our neighborhood and my, my boys were really young, they'd all jump on the couch and they just watch the truck go and dump the garbage and go by. They loved it. This is like that all day long. They can watch all this garbage just getting dumped out on the floor, big loaders pushing it. So why do you have to be opening. young for that to be good? Yep. Well, we kind of all you know, want to go. Yeah. We, sort of anyone weird. can come. All, everyone's welcome. Okay. Uh, this is based off of a, a similar uh, transfer station that was in the middle of Seattle. And um, if you go to that transfer station, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a garbage transfer station just like this. Uh, but right across the street are the headquarters for Brooks Shoes. And, and you have parks and you have houses, really nice houses all around it. And, and it's just a nice, nice facility. But you go up into this facility and they have a room just like our room. And there's tables, drink machines, and you see 
uh, quite a few mothers in there visiting while their kids are, are, are looking through the windows at the garbage trucks, as well as uh, the, they had a just this mock transfer station and dump with garbage trucks and loaders that the kids could play with in there. And, and uh, it's not quite done yet, but the uh, UVU students are working to, to make uh, such a thing for, for our transfer station that, that kids can play with while they're up there. It's a big enough room that a whole grade school class can come and, and uh, get a lesson on, on where does the garbage and the recycling, the household hazardous waste, how are they processed, how does it work in our city. So we're really excited about this facility in a lot of uh, ways how it's going to help our community. Uh, there's a grand opening for the transfer station on April 25th. And that will be from noon to 5 with ribbon cutting at, at 2. Uh, and there will be a lot of great events there. Anyway, main thing that we want to get out to the general public is spring cleanup will look a little different this year. Uh, instead of going to the park with your garbage, uh, tarp it and go to our new transfer station and come and see what a great facility we now have uh, or will have. Uh, beginning April 26th, uh, don't go there until then, uh, uh, for, for uh, garbage. Uh, any questions about that? No, but Chris, you're doing a good job. You're the city manager tonight. You're the assistant city manager, the public <laughs> information officer, the presenter, everything. Ph photographer. You're, photographer. Yeah. You're doing a good job. <laughs> Thanks. I'm excited about this, this Chris, a lot. I, I like it a lot better than what we did last year. I know there are some folks that are disappointed that we don't have dumpsters at our parks, but um, I'm going to be super blunt. The adults in our community couldn't figure out how to not dump garbage on onto the parking lots. And so we need to do something different. So I think it's a great change, and we get the opportunity to see something new and it's not the transfer station of old. I was at the transfer station on Saturday um, and attempting to back my trailer into the thing. This will be much better. We'll take the to take guys like me out of the backing world so I can just pull in, dump, and go. Um, we'll move through this pretty quick, and it's, it's, it'll be a good experience. I think it's a great opportunity for the citizens to go check it out and do it for free. And then we don't have to clean up the mess. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of great features for this transfer station. I actually think there's one more slide showing how massive the indoor part of this is. And, and, and when this was originally designed, the committee that was steering the design of this uh, uh, asked, there, there was a room for expansion if, if, if the, uh, the, this area grew faster than what we thought. And there's this area where it could expand to be 15% bigger and they, they asked the architect and the contractor how much would it cost to just build that expansion now so we don't waste money in, in the wall that gets removed and then expanded. And it wasn't that much more money. And so the decision was made, let's, let's bite the bullet, let's do it now. It'll, it'll save so much money in, in the long run. And if you, if you look, uh, there, there is a, a huge floor. There will be plenty of room to, to come in, back your trailer like, like no Shane was saying. No backing, just come, dump, go. <laughs> and, 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 and put it in a pile, and then yeah. it gets pushed into these, uh, gets pushed in, into these openings to be hauled off. Uh, there's misters in, in, in here, which uh, will uh, keep the dust down, but also uh, they're scented in a way that, that it shouldn't smell bad here. And um, there is a state-of-an-art uh, fire control mechanism in here. So... Believe it or not, garbage catches fire very easily. There's, we have, we have uh, fires in our garbage trucks quite often. And um, when they don't garbage, usually it's from a battery or something and, or, or some flammable liquid that was disposed of. And, and if any fires start anywhere, uh, there is a jet cannon that can put it out immediately. And there's sensors that find out where the fire is. It's really, it's really a great, great uh, facility. This Spanish Fork is one of a few cities that make up the district 
Now that the transfer station is actually in Spanish Fork, can you speak to the benefit that residents in the city of Spanish Fork have or receive by having it actually located in Spanish Fork? Yeah, yeah. Um, Provo, uh, Springville, Mapleton, Spanish Fork, Salem, uh, and uh, uh, Woodland Hills and Goshen are all together in, in the transfer station. Um, having it in the city actually saves us money because we contract out the garbage collection and that the charge that we have to pay for the garbage trucks to drive now will be a little shorter. They, they won't have to drive as far, and, and that's a great asset to the city. Another uh, positive for the city is with the transfer station, a lot of utilities got brought to an area that that we'll be able to develop now into to jobs for our community. And uh, it, it's, it's an industrial area, which is what you want built around an airport. Airports are not good for residential development because of how noisy the planes are. And so you want industrial there. Industrial's really good not at just providing jobs, but, but those big industrial buildings are very expensive. And the property tax on them is significant and it brings in a huge amount of money to our schools and, and it helps pay for schools and and and, and the city as it is so it's it, uh, this transfer station uh, caused a lot of positive change in the city and it's, it's just a lot nicer facility our other facility was was very overrun do I remember right it was 10,000 square feet to 100,000 square feet yeah yeah maybe just under 100 but yeah yeah that's right well, and I appreciate the, the tour that we went over last meeting here, but uh, Terry Ficklin letting us know the environmental aspects of, of waste as well, that now you can keep it all indoors and, 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 uh, and get it uh, taken care of. If Councilman Marshall went to the current station and, and dropped some garbage off, it's obvious to see that it's a lot of that garbage is piled outside and it's, it's not done. environmental friendly. This is time that we do this, and, and it's in a great spot. So appreciate your leadership, Chris. I know it goes a little bit unsung un, uh, of uh, years and years of meetings that you've been to to, to get uh, this to come to fruition where it's at as well. So it's no small effort. Appreciate your leadership and help on that as well, and multiple council members serving on that committee. So thank you. Civil engineer's dream. Waste. He always wanted to talk about right. garbage. I know. A transfer station no, and a yep. treatment plant in yep. one Pretty good administration. That's pretty amazing. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> doesn't get any better. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so watch for those vouchers, uh, uh, Spanish Fork, and uh, that's where you're going to do your your yard cleanup, uh, so we can make all the yards really pretty. Because Councilwoman Beck is going to tell us something in the future about yards, and it's going to be really cool. So keep your yards clean. It's a good way to get a good start going. So. Okay, takes us to item B. If there's no more questions about uh, the, the uh, spring cleanup, takes us to item B with Mr. Trevor Sperry here. He has he and the family have done really well sitting through Kids some, need some candy. I'd say we got Chad's always good. Chief, to make sure they Chief get Johnson candy. got us covered over there. Oh, he oh, got yeah. you covered. Take okay, care. thank you, Chief. He didn't give you sunglasses though. We got sunglasses. <laughs> Bouncy balls. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, um, Mr. Sperry, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you just woke him up. <laughs> so just briefly, uh, I wanted to talk about the Great Shakeout, the Great Utah Shakeout, which is this week, Thursday. Uh, this is an earthquake exercise that Utah gets to participate in every year. It's sponsored by uh, the Department of Public Safety at the state and then also the program called Be Ready Utah. Um, and this program is nationwide uh, within the states that experience earthquakes. Uh, and so this week is, is Thursday. Uh, we actually practiced our earthquake drill um, as a city for, uh, employees on last Thursday at 8 a.m. Uh, Nick Porter sent out a message to our employees at 8 a.m. saying this is an exercise. Uh, please evacuate, drop cover and hold on, wait till the shaking stopped, and then evacuate your buildings. Supervisors, um, took count of who, who was there, who was missing. Of course, it was all a mock scenario, um, but it's always good to practice evacuating a building and creating a rallying point, making sure everyone's accounted for. 
after the evacuation, they had a brief meeting uh, as, as groups, and they talked about what would we do in a real scenario, um, checking in our families, checking on each other, offering first aid, right, these types of things that may happen uh, in a real scenario. And then about 8.15, a message went out to personnel assigned to the Emergency Operations Center, uh, or the EOC. This is located at the Justice Center. Um, it's typically our training room, but during these exercises, we open it up as the EOC. And it's basically where we receive incidents uh, citywide. Uh, we can see our, our GIS crew pulled up a map for us, and they were able to live track uh, the incidents coming in. So our crews out in the field, they were given scenarios in an envelope uh, that they had to address. Uh, they had to, to arrive on scene and talk about what they would do in this type of scenario. Uh, and then this year we, d we decided to organize in an area command structure. So we divided the city into four quadrants and we designed, uh, we assigned one leader to each quadrant and they were kind of the, the leader over that quadrant. They received all the calls uh, via phone call, radio, runner of these incidents. They would then input the incident onto a Google Sheet, uh, which populated in the EOC. And as we received them, we addressed them, we prioritized them, and we assigned resources. Of course, uh, lessons were learned, um, things that we can do better, and that happens every time, and that's why we exercise these things, how we can better respond to and recover from a disaster. Um, and so these things we will implement in the coming years, uh, this year through various exercises, and for next ShakeOut. Uh, we hope to get better each time to, to better serve our residents here in, in the community. Uh, that brings me to this week, which is uh, Thursday, the, the exercise for our residents. A few weeks ago, we organized a block captain training held at the Veterans Building. Uh, we were, it was very well attended. We had over 100 residents come and we put together a block captain training specific for our residents. And we discussed things like getting to know your neighbor, um, understanding the needs in our households. Uh, so we, we wanted to make clear to the residents that this is not a church program, but we do operate off of the, the boundaries of the church, the LDS church, the stakes, uh, but to involve everybody. Uh, so the important thing for block captains is to know your neighbors. Right, distribute important information to, to their block, such as the upcoming Great Shakeout. And then in the emergencies, uh, assess and report the at the neighborhood command post. This is just a centralized location where the neighborhood can meet. They can account for uh, their neighbors uh, and, and address any needs. Many of us are familiar with uh, the window cards uh, that, are, that are distributed. Uh, Typically during the exercise, they place a colored placard out in their window, and as the block captains go by, they understand kind of the situation in that household. Uh, green, all is well. Yellow, we need help, but it's not critical. Red, we need immediate help. And then white, uh, we are vacated. It's vacant or we've already evacuated. And then we've created some documents that help the block captains do their job. Um, beforehand, before the exercise, we asked that they kind of understand the needs in their neighborhood if the neighbors are willing to disclose the information, um, any special unique needs in the household such as mobility impairments, uh, language barriers, uh, you know, they require power at home for oxygen or refrigerated medicine, things like that, so that people can kind of better understand the needs in their neighborhood. And then during the exercise, uh, we have a block tally sheet where they can pre-fill pre the form with, the, with their neighbors, the family members, how many are there. And then during the exercise, they can account for who's there, who's missing. Uh, if they're missing, do they know where they are and if they're okay or if they're unaccounted for and they can't communicate with them. And then finally, during the emergency, they can account for any injuries, fires, gas leaks, or other problems and concerns. Of course, this is just an exercise, so lots of times we have to play off of scenarios, but this gets the, the community ready for a, a real disaster that we hope never hits. Um, but in any case, our residents can be uh, the most prepared they can. Uh, and then finally, 
at the end of the evening, uh, we have a liaison with the Utah County Sheriff's Office, ECS team, or the Emergency Communications and Support team. They come to our radio room uh, and they receive calls via ham radio uh, from each stake in the area after they've received their reports from their community. Uh, so from block captains to wards, from wards to stake, uh, and then they can report the numbers and he can jot them down and be in communication with the county and address any needs here in our, in our community specifically. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, exercise went well last week. Uh, we'll address lessons learned moving forward and we, we anticipate a good participation from our residents this week. Um, so, so hope to hear from them this week of Thursday. Perfect. So, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Sperry? No questions, but I will say, yeah, Trevor, you're doing you're doing an awesome job. I feel confident knowing that if there's ever a disaster in our city, the work that you've put in with the CERT team and just the community in general, um, the planning that you do, the block captains, I know that we we will be prepared, and a lot of it's due to the work that you're putting in, so thank you. Thank you. On that note, we know we... We had some flooding last year, some flooding event. Currently working with FEMA to get some reimbursement from that. So hopefully I'll have a positive report in a few weeks on that note. So great. Yeah. Maybe this year just focus on the great shakeout and not have to focus on the river yeah. uh, touching its <laughs> banks, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Trevor. Appreciate it. Okay. Takes us to uh, item eight uh, on the agenda, the consent items. We have items A through D. Any questions from the council on any of those consent items? If not, I would entertain a motion approving the consent items. I make a motion to approve the consent items. Second. Motion made by Councilwoman Beck, seconded by Councilman uh, Marshall. Um, the slackers on the other end are just we're not just doing getting, that gig. We're just getting we're started. Just getting what are you talking yeah. about? All right. Uh, motion <laughs> made and seconded. Up. All in favor of approving the consent items, say yes. 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 Consent items are approved. It takes us to the public hearing section. We have two items uh, of public hearing tonight. Edge Town Homes General Plan Amendment Ordinance is item A and first, and then we'll go to item B after that. Mr. David Anderson. Mr. Mayor, thank you. The property that we're talking about is on the same side as the really large building. It's at the mouth of the canyon, the one that's just on this side of the big windmills. Um, altogether over 100 acres on the site. I noticed that our staff report mentions that we're talking about 21 acres tonight. It's actually closer to 60. Um, shown here on this map, uh, this is a depiction of what our future land use map would look like if the proposal gets approved the way it's proposed right now. So, there we go. You see this orange area right here? That would indicate that the future land use plan for that property is high density residential. Um, right now, what's shown in orange, as well as, as is shown here, the remainder of the property. So this is the large building, about a million square feet. This is US 6. Over here, uh, Highway 89 intersects with the subject property. Um, someplace over, well, intersects with US 6, not far from the subject property, just to the north right in there. Uh, just a couple of other points of reference. Right now, all of the property that's tied to the large warehouse building is designated as industrial on the land use map. And in fact, right now it's all zoned. It's all zoned industrial as well. Tonight we're not talking about changing the zoning. We're just talking really about the concept of what's shown in orange there. Again, about 60 acres potentially being developed residentially. The Planning Commission has discussed this a number of times. You guys have talked about it once before. So I'm just going to kind of leave it there. That's, that is the proposal by way of um, changing the future land use plan. I will mention that the Development Review Committee and Planning Commission have both recommended that this be approved, again, after 
um, many months of, of different conversations that we've had. Um, should the general plan get amended, that really doesn't do anything until the, the zoning gets changed. There would be a process. Typically, it's a pretty lengthy process because, as a general rule, we don't bring zone changes ultimately to the city council unless we have some pretty detailed development plans, you know, down to engineered plans and things like that, um, that basically make it possible for the developer to uh, somewhat immediately after a zone change proceed forward to develop. Um, so that would be the next step if the city council kind of sends the, the signal that you're comfortable with that by changing the general plan tonight. Um, I know the applicant has a presentation that they have given. I think they want to want to make that. Um, I appreciate that, that they've made it pretty succinct. I think that uh, is in order again just because it's been discussed. But I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have of me, maybe before we invite them up to, to talk through things in more detail. Any questions for Dave before we invite the applicant up? So, Dave, typically we do a general plan and then a zone. Why? Why just the general plan? In this case, I would suggest that just that not doing them at the same time. I think that's the right way to do it all the time, really. In this case, I think it's of a lot of value to do it that way, because going from this state to where we would have to be, at least for staff to be comfortable to recommend that the zoning be changed. You're talking about going from probably tens of thousands of dollars worth of engineering work to six figures plus of engineering and design work. So really looking, this isn't just testing the water, but you know, looking for a fairly strong indication. You guys are comfortable with this concept. Um, part certainly, I think, of staff recommending that this be approved at this point is we do think that some of the things that have been challenges to overcome before, as this concept is, has been discussed and Honestly, this has been discussed for 15 plus years, you know, going back to previous property owners that talked about it, uh, some of the fundamental concerns that we've had in the past, um, we think can be addressed, so. So this would sort of give the applicant, the folks around it, the understanding of where we're, where we would like to see the land change or how we'd like to see it change or how we'd like to see it develop without getting into really detailed concepts about what it's going to do. So it's, I guess it's, the, the intent is to send the signal that, um, not that we've just given a thumbs up, we've said yes, we want that type of land use there. Now going, jeez, I gotta stop talking with my hands. I can't talk without my hands. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it signals that our intention is to do something different than industrial or whatever the land use might be. So now you can spend the money to find the, the details or get into the details in, instead of, I think we talked about something on the south end of town where it was going to be a land or a general plan amendment and a land use or a zone change. And we're, we weren't comfortable with either one, but the applicant had spent a bunch of time and money getting to the, the zone change requirement. So that I think I like this better. This is new for us, I think. Um, but I like this process a little bit better than jumping to the next step and stringing the applicant along in one aspect or the other. So I, I like do too. I, and I appreciate that description. I think that's a good way to put it. So I've got some concerns, but I'm trying to decide do I bring them up now or wait until after the presentation? I think I'm going to wait until after public hearing, and then we can address, address what my thoughts are. Okay. Anything else for Dave? Yeah, if the applicant's here, please come up and before we go into public hearing, give us uh, give us the presentation. Thank you, council members. Uh, John Bankhead with Vesta. We are the current owners of the property and of the uh, large industrial building. Um, I am not going to get into a great deal of detail over the last year of conversations, but I did want to just highlight a few items and then uh, certainly... Um, ask questions or open for questions. How do I uh, go to the next page? I think it's the scroll. <coughs> yeah. Chris, could you would you mind going to the next page? 
So just a, a quick overview, it's 135 acres of total ground. About half of that is currently developed as an industrial use. Um, several of the challenges that we have been trying to work through with staff and planning commission are 135 acres at this point has 400 feet of frontage on a city road. So that is very difficult in terms of utilities and access and I think that is one of the substantial issues that this property has had over the last 15 years. And uh, Chris's team, particularly Jared Johnson, uh, I think came up with kind of the key idea that we think unlocks uh, not only the, the site for future development, but also provides a lot of benefit to the surrounding uh, areas in terms of trail connection, intersections, and things like that. Um, could, could we go to the next slide? Uh, so we wanted to approach this as a master planned community with uh, various components, a residential component, a commercial component, and an industrial component. Some of the challenges that we have been working through with staff um, and some of the things we heard from both planning commissioners, staff members, and, and several of you uh, kind of focused on three things. I'm sure there are others, but these were kind of the three primary ones that we've been focusing on over the course of the last six to nine months. One is we want, uh, there was a strong desire to have a variety of housing but particularly along the bench between the Finger Hut Road, the private road that leads to the industrial and the golf course, there was a strong desire to make that all single family housing and provide a lot of different variety. So the, the, the concept that we would be proposing as part of the zone change uh, in the future would have that all be uh, single family lots. Um, secondly, there was a concern about how to get people in and out of this from a secondary access, fire access. Um, there have been several ideas kicked around. None of them were really as appealing to the city until uh, Jared and Chris talked about a future connection, which we're really pretty darn excited about, that would come across the property between the industrial and the residential and a new intersection would take place at the Highway 89, Highway 6 interface and a new bridge built across the railroad tracks. Um, we've met with all the various parties and while that is going to be a complicated process, we're very confident in our ability to get that designed, permitted, and funded at a, at a very reasonable time frame. When you say reasonable time frame, does that mean as the project happens or at a later date? It would probably be at a later date, but we're talking a matter of probably two, three years-ish and not five or ten years. Okay. So that being said, as part of the um, process of moving forward with a zone change, we wanted to address how we could start the project and at the same time give the city assurances that actually will happen and can happen. And so we're working through some of the mechanics of that, but we have a strategy to guarantee uh, on our end that, that we would be providing access, roads, deeding land to the city, the project would be designed for that to occur. We tend to think we can get it funded next legislative session and we're working on that on the developer end as well as working with staff on that. But that is that that has not yet been formalized. And then the final thing um, that we've really been focusing on in the, the Highway 89 uh, intersection was key to is how to, one, create a meaningful trail system within the project, but two, really connect the larger state trail system and municipal trail systems of Spanish Fork and Mapleton um, through this property. That's been something that I know has been worked on for a long time with uh, it, um, crossings further south that have not been able to happen for several reasons. With this new intersection and new trail that we are, uh, we will be proposing as part of the zone change in the plat, you have a very nice at, at, you know, for the trail at grade crossing that will just go right over the railroad and be able to connect um, the Bonneville shoreline trail all the way up into Salt Lake and then the trail system that will ultimately extend down to the end of Utah County. So those are three of the primary concerns uh, that we have been working through. There have been lots of other um, uh, 
concepts that have been influencing these decisions, the separation between the residential use and the industrial use. How, how do we protect that neighborhood, um, it, both in the short term from a safety perspective and the long term from a value and nice place to live perspective? So we, th there are a, a, a thousand concepts that we're happy to chat with, but I wanted to just give you the overview of what we have been trying to achieve and then open that to questions. We have more slides. We can talk about what we think the development actually will look like. We can talk about materiality. We can talk about where the trails are, show you how this intersection might line up. But I wanted to let you ask some questions and, and lead that discussion. Is the commercial piece still part of your plan, what you've shown here? Yes. Okay. Where would the trail um, go through that we, you know, connect the, the different trails you were referencing a minute ago? Um, Chris, there is a PDF in there called, uh, Whis no, I think it's Whispering Pines number 29. We, we've had a few iterations on this over the, uh, the last little while. So in his, as he's uh, looking for that, there are, there are a couple of different points of access. Do I have a laser pointer here? Oh, yeah, perfect. I don't know if this laser pointer. So there, this, this piece is functionally triangular shaped. On kind of the northwest side would be the powerhouse um, road. Down on, and directions here are a little bit funky, so we'll call it the southwest. The Dripping Rock Trail comes along the Spanish Fork River, and there is a bridge, an existing bridge, down at the far end. Our proposal would be that we connect to that bridge, and then the trail system runs up through the project and ultimately crosses at this new intersection that is at Highway 89 and Highway 6. Oh, I just have to, I have to be smart. I was going to make fun of Chris for his IT skills, and I can't even press a button. Um, <laughs> so there would be a connection here and a trail system that would come up through here. Um, but between the industrial, the existing industrial building and the proposed residential, there's about a 200-foot buffer and a grade separation. The, right now, we're thinking that the trail connection would come right through here and ultimately across this bridge and connect into the Mapleton Trail System. Edge Homes, who is the uh, proposed buyer and developer of this parcel, is developing the 1,100 units in Mapleton across the freeway, and we are coordinating with them and Mapleton to make sure that these trail systems and their bike parts and all those things tie together. And then, uh, Chris, would you mind scrolling down so we can see the kind of the northern west? Um, as part of the proposed development, we understand that there is a lack of parking in the general area for both the golf course as well as the trail system. So we're working through a couple of options to provide uh, an access perhaps from Powerhouse Road up to the development, but in any case, we're proposing that the developer install a trailhead with bathrooms so that the general public as well as the um, residents of the area have easy access to gain uh, to this regional trail system. Uh, other questions? Comments? Criticisms? For John? Or do you want to you want to go to public hearing and yeah. maybe have some we'll questions after? If any, I don't know that anybody's here for it, but yeah. Public hearing. Let's do that. Let's do it. Thank you, John. Thank you. I'd entertain a motion to go into public hearing for item A. So moved. Second. Motion made by Councilman Card and seconded by Councilman Euler to go into public hearing for item A. All in favor say yes. Yes. We're in public hearing for the Edge Town Homes General Plan Amendment Ordinance. Anybody from the public that would like to speak to this, please come up and let us know. Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. So moved. Motion made by Councilman Euler. Took it. Seconded by Councilman Took. All in favor say yes. 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 We're out of public hearing. Discussion back up here. Uh, questions, Dave. I have a couple of questions, or a question, maybe not two. Um, so the designation that's been proposed is high density for gen for the general plan. Um, as I look at it, my personal feelings, or as I see it, it make more sense with with the proposed 
commercial and housing and you know there's a master plan development all of that um, the designation of mixed use would make more sense in my mind because of the fact that it encompasses the same zoning as I look at the number of units it wouldn't change anything that they're trying to do with the property but just from what we're trying to do from the different types of uses on the property it would make more sense um, from a cleanness standpoint so it's just maybe semantics um, any thoughts there Chris, do you mind going back to that first map that we looked at, just the general plan? I just want to make sure that I understand exactly what you're saying. Councilman Carden, in the staff report. Doc, yeah. There. Yep, thanks. So you're suggesting that um, where this is mixed use here, that blue color, mm -hmm. is what we used to identify the mixed use designation on the land use map that instead of this being orange, perhaps just everything would be designated mixed use there. We'd keep the same boundary there. Yeah. Everything would be industrial. Yeah, because um, as, I, as I look at the, zone, or the zoning that are potentially in that general plan, high density has R3, R4, and R5, infill overlay, which wouldn't be applicable here. Um, Mixed use has R16, R3, R4, R5, urban village, residential office, commercial office, and commercial one. So it just gives a more succinct opportunity for what we're trying to do here, at least as I see it. Yeah, I think particularly, um, I believe right now this corner is zone C1. Um, is that right? Your property? Uh, let me finish a thought and then, yeah, by all means, I think. Yeah, you're um, correct, Dave, it is. I, I think it is entirely a matter of the council's preference, really. Um, either approach, I think, would accomplish what we're talking about. Um, I see the logic, certainly appreciate it. Uh, either way, yeah. I think, ultimately, you could get to a point and be consistent with the general plan to where you'd have that C1 zoning remain. And this probably zoned R3, you know, talking about the kind of proposal that you were shown a moment ago. Um, I certainly have no concerns okay. with going mixed use instead of high density residential. John, is there something John? Else? Question for the group. Would the mixed use zoning in any way preclude the industrial use? No. Okay. Because we would just do it the same with where the orange is at now. Oh, okay. It would just be blue, and oh, okay. the industrial would stay where it's currently okay. at. Perfect. Yeah. All right. I just is your question is your question to be able to come back and and if things changed to to have industrial use uh, creep no, into I, the orange I, space. I, I thought you might be asking mm -hmm. to change the entire 135 no. acres, no. and so the zoning just on the, the existing building might go mixed no, use. Just so the that probably okay. Yeah. Yeah. No stress there. And then my second question is separate than this. But it was just about that bridge, um, and this might be putting the cart before the horse. If we were to, if that was a part of the, if we were talking about zoning today, would we be able to make that a contingency on the approval? Certainly. Okay. With the zoning. That was, yeah, that that was just a question. I, like I said, I'm, we're looking farther down the road, but I just want to have that question. And I'm stressing just a little bit. As, so to make sure we're clear. We're not talking about changing the zoning tonight. Right. So in fact, if this gets approved, um, the property owners could still develop what we're showing there in orange with That's big true. industrial buildings because we're not talking about changing the zoning. So they keep that right. It kind of, this kind of just creates another option yep. for them. Right. You know, should they choose to proceed forward? Does that make sense? Yep. I don't want to. Thanks. Jesse addressed some of what my concerns were. Um, you guys have spent a lot of time with the Planning Commission. I've watched the meetings. You've, you've jumped through a lot of hoops to get your plan to what they've asked, and I appreciate that. It's, it's much better what you've got now than what you initially proposed. I did not like at all the other road that you had coming down onto Powerhouse and intersecting there, so I'm glad that that's gone away. I think my concern as well is making sure the bridge happens. If, if you could take what you've presented and shown us tonight and guarantee and make sure that's exactly what 
what was built with that bridge and the trail and everything else. I, I think I love it. Um, my concern initially was zoning it, or not zoning it, but general plan. When we general plan something, that means nine out of ten times or ten out of ten times, that's what is going to be zoned and built eventually, right? And so whatever we're general planning now, even though we're not doing the zoning portion, we're basically saying this is what it will be zoned eventually. And so my, my only concern was if we're general planning it to be this, the high density, and we, we actually want those single-family homes to be part of this development in the future, does that tie our hands if another developer comes in and buys this, you guys end up selling it to Edge, Edge walks away from it, decides to sell it to someone else, and we've already at that point then general planned and zoned the whole area to be high density. What happens if the next developer that comes in and purchases it decides they don't want to put single family because it's already zoned for the for the high density? Does that tie our hands? Yeah, so Tell me if this helps. Even if the zoning were changed tonight to R3, and that's not part of what we've noticed for and part of what we're ready to have you act on, but even if that were to happen by right, all that an applicant could do without having, for example, the master plan development overlay approved by the city council would be to develop the property with lots that are at least 6,000 square feet in size and that meet certain lot width and lot depth requirements. Um, so there would still be that step that they would have to go through to get you know anything other than just that approved for the site. Now, we're not presenting a zone change tonight, though, I think specifically because we don't want to tie anybody's hands until we're sure about access and a lot of other things. Um, and certainly the applicants have done, I think, a good job in starting to try to work through some of the concerns. We, I think, we're there as staff and feeling like there's some genuine potential. So the reason we're moving forward now with the general plan is just to give assurance to these gentlemen and to Edge, who are, sounds like are the p potential buyers, that we as a council are comfortable with what they're proposing. I would say no to that. I would say that we are comfortable with a different land use designation here, not what they're proposing. Which not evaluating could. what they're proposing. I think it's helping us inform the decision of what could be up there. But this is sending the signal that we're comfortable with a density there. Instead of industrial. Which brings, Instead of industrial. Which brings up the question then, if we're designating the entire section to be high density, are we comfortable with potentially down the road, let's say things fall through and we've designated it now to be high density, are we, can, are we comfortable with the entire thing being high density? So that's, I think, how the general plan works, right? Yeah. In a swath of land, we're comfortable, but I think to Jesse's point, which I like, if it's multi-use or was that what it's mixed, use. mixed use, there's a range of zoning op options in there from yeah. higher density to lower density, and someone can back, could come back and propose that. And we get to say yes or no to that, right? Yeah. We get to say that is consistent with the general plan, and we like that exact concept. So I think what this does is it just, instead of um, back and forth and meeting on the side or whatever, we send a clear message, we're comfortable with, with a density here. Yeah. Go forth now, put a proposal together that we can approve with the zoning. And in the meantime, it doesn't change property rights at all, yeah. which I really like. All right, like you said, if these gentlemen want to just say, oh, never mind, we couldn't get there, we're just going to do industrial, they have every right to do that, and we haven't changed that at all. And so I think it gives them some assurance that we would say yes to something in the future, but it doesn't tie us hand, our hands, I don't think, in almost anything. So I think that's the discussion you're going to have throughout a process of this is the first step of a process where a master plan development is still on the table because the master plan <coughs> development style of this is, hey, yeah, here's the signal of the general plan adjustment we did, but, but after that, it's 
we, we want to make sure this access looks like this. We want to make sure this trail access looks like this. All the things that you couldn't just ask for, you know, if somebody just came in and fit the lots on the right size. I, I, yeah. I just don't see this this very prominent um, section of our city that is people coming into our city, it not it not being developed as a master plan development. So what do our citizens get out of that? We should we should be, you know, we should be very clear on what we get out of that. Then yeah, we get sure. trail connections. But we get you know we get things that are struggling in the area right now. But like you said, this step is necessary for that next step to happen, or else we don't have those conversations, and it just becomes, well, what can we fit on the property? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it. We need to answer the question: Do we want citizens here or not? Or do we want residential in this in this area or not? I think we. I think for me, it's yes. And I think um, it's yes, and it's a place where you could put some density because the access is so good. I was you're not, right there. Yeah, you're not driving through any neighborhoods to get to it, so it makes a ton of sense to me. Um, so I, I would be, I don't know that I want to live three stories above the ground here and face the wind every single day right in my kitchen, but still. <laughs> it's called whispering. It's, it's <laughs> howling. So Shane, to your point, what what do we want, right? Do I want density here? Do I want residential here? It depends for me. For me, it depends on that access. If we don't get that access, absolutely not. Um, having just that one road in and out that you would be sharing then with semi trucks that are going to Finger Hut. Sure. No, absolutely not. And so it it, it depends. And it, so if it, we can make that a condition. Um, that it's contingent on on the road being built, the bridge being built, then absolutely. But so but a future zoning <clears throat> contingent on that, correct? The, Not the general plan. Which which then goes to back to Jesse's point. I I feel more comfortable. I think making it mixed use rather than um, the high density. So if that's the case, I would want to make sure that these gentlemen are able to do everything that they want to do with that designation compared to the to the other before we make that decision. Sure. So I don't know if, Dave, you can answer that, if you know for sure that that would be all right. Um, having what is shown in orange zoned R3, which is what I think they want, based on what they've shown, it's what they want. Um, you could do that with either general plan designation. Okay. The C1 zoning. Either scenario works for that. Um, so we're really not talking about changing that. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's just a matter of what the council prefers. Okay. Thank you. It's this is sort of an interesting conversation, right? We're going through a general plan update today, and we will be plopping down colors on our general plan, just in, in terms of. We want to see this type of use here, this type of use here. In this case, because we have a little bit more information, we're evaluating that information at sort of the wrong stage. I don't disagree with Kevin at all. I don't think I would say yes without a second access. Um, but it, that is, in fact, the next step. But because I have that information today, I can give you that feedback today. So it's, it's a little bit odd. I can't decide whether I like more information or less making a general <laughs> land use decision like this, but um, I like it better than having them at the same time, for sure. Um, I am comfortable with Jesse's change and putting residents up here. I think that's a good place for people to live. And what better lot in the world than looking to the west? Like that is that is a pretty spectacular lot. A windbreak behind you with your 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 neighbors. And uh, an incredible view out the at the west side. Agreed. So, I've seen it from the tenth hole before, over there. I'm also comfortable with it, but I do need to disclose that Edge Homes is my client at my place of employment. I work at Utah Valley Magazine, so I just need to disclose that before I vote. Thank you. Any other questions for staff, the applicant that we have here? 
again, before maybe this gets to a, a motion, uh, thank you to um, uh, the Planning Commission. Thank you to Dave's office. Thank you to DRC. Thank you to the applicant. Uh, uh, it's not it's not the easiest easiest place uh, in our city, uh, and and so we we appreciate uh, the, the the months and and going on years probably that's been into work here, uh, and uh, so it doesn't it doesn't go unnoticed. We appreciate everybody's everybody's good work. If there's no other questions, I'd entertain a motion on on uh, item A. It sounds like uh, Councilman Cardin was maybe. Yeah. Thinking about uh, uh, an adjustment yeah. to, to maybe the motion. So I move to approve the uh, Edge Townhomes General Plan Amendment Ordinance based upon the findings contained in the ordinance and staff report, with the amendment of the general plan to mixed res or mixed use. Second. Motion made by Councilman Cardin, seconded by Councilman Marshall. It's a roll call vote here. Councilman Took. Yes. Councilman Cardin? Yes. Councilman Euler? Yes. Councilwoman Beck? Yes. Councilman Marshall? Yes. Item A is approved with that adjustment. Okay. Takes us to item B tonight of the public hearing section. Thanks, uh, you guys. Thank you. Yep, thank you, guys. Uh, this is an ordinance approving impact fee analysis, impact fee facilities plan, and impact fee enactment. Mr. Chris Thompson. <laughs> Okay, this is a process that we go through every year, and uh, uh, impact fees change as projects come on to our 10-year capital facilities plan, and as we complete projects and get costs, and as we see inflationary aspects, and uh, and so uh, just to introduce you to how this works. I wonder if Brian just come out here and sit with us. We need Brian to come Every time touch. he touches oh. it, it works. Oh, okay. So, um, see, told you you came out and it worked. He threatened it. It's scary. That's why him. I feel at home. I say, Chris, this isn't working. And suddenly he stands there and it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, the power impact fee was $2,071 for a, a regular home. Um, last year when we did the impact fee study. The maximum allowable at, at with this study is 2,600, and we are proposing to keep it at 2,071. Now, uh, that in essence means we are, are not collecting ar around $500 per home of the actual real impact that they are having on our power system. And I can talk a little bit about why we um, are proposing that, but basically, uh, <clears throat> maybe, maybe could you scroll up to the next, to the graph? Just want to explain a little bit about impact fees on most cities. Uh, we are a little bit unique in that we update our impact fee study every year. Uh, most cities uh, pay several hundred thousand dollars to get their impact fees updated, and since it's such a huge cost, they don't do it except for every seven to ten years, which really hurts them when inflation comes. Um, but you will know which cities recently have updated their impact fee studies because they're right here. Last year, Salem was the most recent, and they were the highest. Now Highlands, the most recent to do their impact fee study, they're the highest. If you looked at our maximum allowable impact fee, Springville used to be way low, but then they they updated, and now they're, they're quite high. We would be the highest if, if, if we went with the maximum allowable. And so... One of the things that, that hurts us is with the Home Builders Association, with, with some other groups that are trying to build homes when there's this high cost. It's also, uh, we are a public power city. And so um, when there's another city that uses, uh, like Rocky Mountain Power, uh, 
a lot of those impact fee type costs are actually collected on their um, on their utility bill, and and that can be done in a number of ways. But the the fair way to do that would be the people who actually cause the impact pay the fee. So uh, one of the things that that we propose is that um, that extra five hundred dollars be collected, still be collected, so that we're fair to the the old time residents. Um, over time, which is a, a little bit easier on on the the building of the home, uh, and uh, it's it's for a short amount of time, a slight increases on the bill on the utility bill, and then that five hundred dollars of power impact fee is is paid. That allows us to propose an overall impact fee that uh, isn't average. I think I, I believe if we were at average, uh, we would be way below the real costs of things because inflation is such a factor in the construction world, especially right now. But even even in in a normal year, uh, construction uh, inflation has been a big issue, um, and and so this is probably about the right spot for us. It's just a little bit above average. Um, if we are going to be completely fair to the existing residents, but also not making it too onerous on on building the home, those costs kind of helping to spread those costs over over a little bit of a period of time with the utility bill. So, Chris, that, just one question, real quick. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about those fees that you're talking about tonight. We're just talking about impact fees, correct? Correct. Okay, just making sure. Correct. So. That's what I kind of wanted to help you understand is that it's okay to not propose the maximum allowable. The state law allows it, uh, and we believe it can be done fairly with um, you know, the existing residents not having to basically finance the new residents coming in. So if we can go back up. So... Uh, power impact fee, we are proposing that it stay the same, no increase. Um, stormwater impact fee, uh, actually, with with projects getting paid off, um, uh, is proposed to go down uh, by about $100, uh, down to $2,300, just over $2,300. That's for a regular stormwater impact fee. We, we have an option that works in several parts of town where uh, the water can go into the ground very easily. Uh, it's called LID or low impact development. Uh, this is actually required by our stormwater permit. And um, if, if a developer comes in and puts in some of this LID type facility and puts the stormwater in the ground, it would not be fair to require them to pay for the large pipes going downstream. And so we actually have a, a lower impact fee for those type of developments, low impact developments. Um, and that went down about $100 as well. Drinking water went up about $170. Uh, that was hit pretty hard by the increased cost of cement. Um, uh, concrete has gone way up. And uh, we're building a very large uh, tank, um, which is all out of concrete. And so those costs went up about $170. Uh, pressurized irrigation also went up about $260. And then wastewater went up the most uh, with the cost of that treatment plant, which happens to have quite a bit of concrete in it as well. And so, uh, and, and, and this is pretty consistent across the valley. So that went up $1,000. Um, public safety went up about $20, and then transportation um, actually went down about $200. Uh, overall, if you can scroll just a little bit, there's a summary. Overall, uh, the impact fees went up about 4.94%, um, if you count in building permit and hookup fees, um, which we do in order to compare ourselves to um, the private power impact, uh, private power cities. So, any questions?
big chunks is the wastewater. Yeah, yeah. The, the treatment plant's coming online, and, and, and so uh, we paid a large part of that bill. And, and so one, one nice thing that has happened is, is it's been coming up, and with all the extra fees collected, uh, most all of the developer finance projects are completely paid off now because um, uh, in anticipating the treatment plant, we, we have collected quite a bit already so so for us as a city who does this every year it would be helpful if other cities were doing this every year because then it wouldn't look like we're on the higher end all the time correct yeah if, if that that would occur yes but at, at the same time we're we don't charge the maximum allowable so right we're we're, we're not that far above average Any other questions for Chris before we go into public hearing for item B? So, Chris, um, the treatment plant, it's going up, concrete it's going up, whatever. But end of the day, the new citizens that are coming couldn't come without it, right? And so they're paying a chunk of it because we couldn't, we couldn't support them if we didn't have a new treatment plant. So we're putting the burden on the new resident because they're going to they own that share of it right yeah yeah it's it's really the only fair you, you you either do it this way or you basically say to the existing residents we want you to pay for the new ones to come right and, and you do that through a higher utility rate right yeah that's what that's how you do it yeah. good point good point good question Okay, I'd entertain a motion to go into public hearing. Or is there somebody here that wants to speak to this before we go into public hearing? Yes, please. State your name for Tara. I'm Eileen Miller. I'm with the Utah Valley Home Builders Government Affairs. Um, I just have to say this one thing. I use Spanish Fork as an example all the time to the other cities. And the reason being is you know real time where you're at. These big jumps that he was talking about that not make you look, not look so good, uh, from a builder's perspective, having them done every year is so much better. And um, you have a sister city that put off um, an increase to an impact fee, didn't do an update on their IFA or IFFP for seven years on recreation. It jumped nearly six thousand dollars in one big swoop. That it just seems to be so irresponsible to me. <laughs> it makes it difficult um, for the builder. It, I can't imagine how a city runs that way, frankly. But I was just at a city council meeting last night and used you as an example, and I. In a, I in a wished, positive way. Pardon me? In a positive way. Well, Usually very, I'm using very an example positive. Of negative way. And I can't say enough good about <laughs> Josie Paxton or John Little. John sits on my government affairs board. He's, I mean, we don't always agree because he's on the opposite end a lot of times, but it's always civil and he contributes amazingly to the conversation. So I applaud you for hiring really good people. But I, if wishes were fishes, I would wish that there would be a state law, even though you have to have a third-party engineering firm certify all of your impact fees. Um, it would be cost-effective to hire and have a position full-time employed as a city employee that would keep track of this stuff real-time. And that way, the city would know where they're at, the builders would know where they're at, and so when it came time to purchase a piece of property, you would know exactly what to expect. So I just came tonight. I read over your IFA or IFP. It was shared with me uh, through your department, through Josie, basically. She does uh, helps me a lot with the IFFP. And I think Tara's actually helped me a few times, too. And I really appreciate that. So you guys have got a great team. 
I, I told the state HBA that if we could sponsor a piece of legislation to make it so that the cities had to do what you do, <laughs> and then maybe have a third party certify what you already have on your books every year, I think that would just be great. So I just came tonight to tell you, good job. <laughs> and thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'd entertain a motion to go into public hearing. I move that we go into public hearing. Motion made second. by Councilman Euler, seconded by Councilman Cardin to go into public hearing. All in favor say yes. 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 We're in public hearing for item B. Anybody from the public that would like to speak to impact fee analysis, fee facilities plan, and impact fee enactment? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion to go out of public hearing. So moved. Motion made by Councilwoman Second. Beck, seconded by Councilman Marshall. All in favor say yes. 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 Discussion back up here. Any further questions on what uh, Chris has presented to us? Not for me. Okay. No. Great job, Chris. Thanks, Thanks for the sign. Yeah. Thank you, Eileen, again for being here and, and uh, being at our, our meeting. And uh, it means you've probably struck pretty good balance if we're if, if, if we're getting to, to where we need to be. So it's not cheap to build, for sure, and the Home Builders Association knows that, and, and impact fees are an important part of it. But uh, we appreciate the transparency and getting it done the right way. Okay, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve the ordinance approving impact fee analysis, impact fee facilities plan, and impact fee enactment. Motion made by Councilman Took. Second. Seconded by Councilman Euler. A roll call vote here. Councilman Marshall. Yes. Councilwoman Beck. Yes. Councilman Euler. Yes. Councilman Cardin. Yes. And Councilman Took. Yes. Good. Item B is approved. Takes us to uh, 10, the new business section. Thanks again, Eileen. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, we got item A, B, and C on the agenda. Before we have Dale go, uh, I think Shane wanted to try to add something to this section, or do you want to wait till we... I can do it now or after C, either way. Let's do it after C. Oh, okay. Is that all right? Yep. Dale is at the... Your game. Dale's, Dale's at the mic, and it's a hot mic. Sorry, I jumped the gun. No, 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 you're fine. <laughs> he got real excited about janitorial. RBM maintenance oh, agreement on. for the parks and well, recreation. Not until it's not done, right? <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, uh, our office opened at our new location yesterday. For business, uh, which is the old library. So come on by. Didn't get a tour. Bring us a housewarming gift, <laughs> a treat, something. Uh, come by and see our office. Uh, this has obviously generated a need to create a new custodial contract. Um, and, and I believe all of you have seen uh, the bids that we had. Uh, RBM, which does a lot of our buildings in the city. Uh, was the lowest bid again at seven hundred and seventy four dollars and fifty nine cents per month um, the contract that you have before you uh, is a two year contract with um, with again an, an option to renew that contract for two additional one year contracts once it's up um, so the total the annual sum uh, there is nine thousand two hundred and ninety five dollars and eight cents per year so we're actually contracting us for uh, for two years at that amount pretty simple and straightforward any questions I just had one quick one is is there a janitorial service cleaning your old facility are were they already or is this yes okay how much was that amount? RB RBM was doing ours as it was we actually canceled that because we weren't quite sure if we were selling or occupying or but uh, since then we have we, we are going to renew that contract at the end of the month how much they charge you I don't know what the exact amount is um, and I don't think I have it at my fingertips here but it's this building's 4,000 square feet larger than that one right so if we want to run the numbers they they do it based about, on square okay. footage and how many offices are okay. in there so it's it's, it's going to be uh, very similar because from what I understand engineering is bringing about the same number of people that we had in there gotcha. uh, so I don't I don't it, it's similar to what this is a hundred dollars less than this okay. yeah cool. 
That was my only question. Sorry, I knew you were going to ask that for some reason, so I tried to get an answer before, but I wasn't quick enough. If they're clean in here, they're probably saving a little bit of money on mobilization, right? They're already here, so they're... Yeah. Yeah. Seems yeah. super cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it, right? <laughs> Well, if, if you look if you look at the rest of the bids that came in, it's substantially cheap, and they and they do a good job. Shane's ready to sign him up for his house. I, I was, I mean, no kidding. Cross my mind. <laughs> <laughs> we got a name for you, Shane. Yeah. If you need it. <laughs> I think Carrie does a great job at your house. She does. She's yeah. amazing. It's really how. Any questions for Dale on this contract? No, I will say I had the chance to be in the building yesterday for a meeting, and it is. It, Beautiful. It looks great inside. The remodel was, was well done. Um, looking out the back windows into the park, I can't think of a better location for a Parks and Rec building. So kudos to you and your team reusing that building for repurposing it for a, a need that we have in our community and excited to have you guys over there. Thanks. Yeah, it's, I think we're the only Parks and Recreation Department in a park. <clears throat> it comes with its benefits, and it's well, we have a few, a few people that like to hang out in the park, so, <laughs> so we we'll tend to take good care of it. Uh, but yeah, we're excited. This this building turned out really nice. Um, it's going to give us enough room, probably for 15 to 20 years, to grow into that. So it's uh, it's going to be a really nice facility for us. So we appreciate the opportunity to to have it. Um, we, we will not, we, since we already have RBM at the other building, that will be a contract renewal. So we'll just have, uh, I believe Seth can sign that. Is that right, Bob? We'll just have Seth sign a renewal on that when we renew it in the, at the end of this month. Awesome. Very I have good. a question for Dale. I just have a question for Kermit Wise. I thought we were changing the limit so something this small didn't come before council. Eighteen thousand. Yeah, I thought we were like up to fifty. I mean, I'm sure we're you're going to yes, go, but if has to go out for bid still. Oh yeah, we still has to be bid, we, but it doesn't need our process, approval. Yeah, That's what for sure. Saying. I can't. Okay. We I need can't to remember. As a I can't remember what the number was. Okay. I'm blaming. Where's blame, Jared when we yeah, need him? Yeah, blame Jared Johnson. Yeah. Just, <laughs> well, he's worked on it for six years now. Yeah, that's true. Good question. So there is an ordinance that says that the city manager can sign contracts that are renewed. I think what you would do is you would actually adjust that resolution to say, and contracts under fifty thousand dollars or something like that. I, I think, thought we had. So I, yeah. I remember. I, I just don't remember the price. Yeah. When we left it, the revised purchasing price was fifteen thousand or less. Oh, it's fifteen thousand or less. Okay. But, right. it, but it doesn't say that it doesn't need to be approved or who could sign this contract. I'll make a motion. Okay. I move to approve the new Parks and Rec's office maintenance agreement and award it to RBM Building Services. Motion made by Councilman Marshall. Second. Seconded by Councilman Euler. A roll call vote here. Councilman Cardin. Yes. Councilman Euler. Yes. Councilwoman Beck. Yes. Councilman Marshall. Yes. And Councilman Took. Yes. Item A is approved. Takes us to B, the Utah DEQ Administrative Settlement Agreement. Chris is a one-man show tonight. Yeah, he's all over. <laughs> well, I missed a couple of council meetings, so this is making up. <laughs> uh, we, so, so... This, our old plant is really old and it's falling apart in a lot of ways and it's hard for us to put real dollars into it when we're spending so much on a new plant. And so uh, one of the reasons why we need to build a new plant is we can't meet regulations very easily with the old plant and there's several times when we go into violation and, and so uh, I, this is actually a really good amount of money <laughs> to pay. We, we're worried it's being well over a hundred thousand um, dollars. So we feel really good. We feel like the state's really working with us. Anything that they could uh, kind of attribute to building a new plant, they did. And so 
uh, we're actually really grateful for this, and we feel like uh, the cost to prevent this would be in the millions, and so to pay this amount is great, and we have a new plant coming online um, soon that will make meeting these regulations quite easy. So we, we are actually really grateful for this settlement agreement. So, Chris, is this just a one-time settlement then? Mm-hmm. We had an exceedant. Yeah, so, so I mean, we're, we're going to 36,000. Um, we, we could see one more like this before the next treatment plant. I can't imagine that. that our numbers are different. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors, but weather's a, a big one. Sure. Okay, so we, we had an, an exceedant. We negotiated a settlement with them. It's thirty something, right? Thirty six thousand. Thirty six. Yeah. Could have been twenty five grand a day. Yeah, it could have been it could, a lot. Yeah. So we've negotiated something that makes sense because we are actively trying to change that. Um, but all the rules still apply moving forward, and so we could actually experience another exceedance and another settlement. Correct. We haven't negotiated a future settlement. No, so just no, for and, the and occurrence that happened in December. December. And we don't know that we will. I mean, sure. but we didn't going change into the winter rules. next year, we, it's possible, depending okay. on the winter, right? Okay. Because our plant is up and our new plant is up and running in ne- 2025. Next year, summer, beginning of summer. So we're really excited about that. We use the same ribbon for the treatment plant and just take it over to the to the uh, rec center afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah probably. We'll different you different know? kind of water. <laughs> Dip it in. Sure. We'll, we'll, we'll have they a big party. Pools. <laughs> <They're both laughs> pools. We'll jump in the water in one. I'm just hoping you know, if, drink if it could jumping. I'm good now. It could be coming online at the same time as the Super Bowl. We could have some real fun with that. Just That's our oh. biggest use time there at the plant. We could do something. That's the best fact to share with kids, too. Yeah, that's right. Just so, we, we're making we're making a business decision, basically, right? Yeah. We have two options: fix so that our effluent is below standard, or negotiate the penalty for being above standard. And because it's thirty six thousand instead of several million, we're saving the taxpayer dollars by going this route. Had we not been building this sewer treatment plant, we would be making modifications to the existing sewer treatment plant to or waste treatment plant to avoid these penalties in the future. Yes? Yeah, and, and, and honestly, a lot of times what the way the state handles things like that is they're like, okay, fix it or pay this penalty, and then you fix it and you don't have the penalty. Mm-hmm. But, but this is this was a very kind thing that the state but worked to, with us on. But to fix the problems, yeah, it just would be a lot more 306% money. exceedance. It would be throwing that money be down the drain, no. down the toilet. No, it's a $150 million <laughs> treatment plant that we're building, and that fixes the problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you're not going to throw the, the good money after nope. bad at the plant that's not no, going to be. not when it's under construction. We'd and, never yeah. flush that amount of money down the toilet. <laughs> I know. I know. Keep them coming. I knew it. Keep that them is, coming. That is engineering humor right there. Boom. So, Chris, Chris, you mentioned that the uh, transfer station is going to have a little display area that the kids can come and watch the work that's being done. <laughs> I, I had never thought of this idea, but I like it. <laughs> right above the headworks we could be, be fascinating. Would be. Amazing. Yeah, Another absolutely. part of an engineer's dream. I, I don't know about everyone the misters. Has to I, don't, I don't think we'll do misters. Yes, everyone has to have a drink. <laughs> no, with no, no misters at that. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that explanation. Good, good questions, Councilman Marshall. Any other uh, questions for item B? If not, I'd entertain a motion for the settlement agreement. I move to approve the Utah Department of Environmental Quality Division of Water Quality Administrative Settlement Agreement. Second. Motion made by Councilman Cardin, seconded by Councilman Marshall. A roll call vote here. Councilman Euler. Yes. Councilman Cardin. Yes. Councilman. Took. Yes. Councilman Marshall. Yes. And Councilwoman Beck. Yes. Item B is approved. Takes us to item C. Mr. Vaughn Pickell. Mayor and Council, this item is related to Utah County has imposed a sales and use tax 
for transportation projects. Um, and they've agreed to devote some of that, that income to the projects here in Spanish Fork, specifically in the Verk Industrial Park. Um, there are several highway projects there that um, will help us to build out that area and facilitate economic development growth there. Um, this is sometimes referred to as the fifth fifth. You might have heard that term. Um, so this agreement sets out the, the amount and the timing, and the, the total amount is $8 million, and it'll come fairly quick. We can request reimbursements of up to $3 million beginning May 1st, and then in November of this year, November 1st, we can request reimbursements for another $5 million. And this is good timing because we are actively in, engaging in property acquisition for these roads right now, so we will be able to use these funds, no doubt, soon. Any questions? Any questions for Vaughn in the fifth fifth? Thank you. Thank you, Vaughn. I, th I think it's important to mention this is um, uh, the partnership of, of Utah County here. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but for us to access this, Utah County had to vote this in as well, correct? Yes, exactly. That's Utah County that's imposed the tax, and they're just directing it our way for our projects in our city. So. so so again, that's a different political level than, than what we're doing here in, in, in cities, but, but the partnership with the county, uh, it, it shouldn't be lost on us. It shouldn't be lost on residents of what that means for them to uh, to, to, to vote for this, um, this tax, this fifth fifth that gets to be directed towards important projects and, and this is a really important one. So if there's no questions on this, I'd entertain a motion. One, so I think we're all, all paused. <laughs> so I'll go waiting. ahead and move to approve the resolution authorizing the mayor to execute an interlocal cooperation agreement between Utah County and Spanish Fork City for highway projects to provide access to the Verk Industrial Park, provided any modifications to the agreement are reviewed and approved by the city manager and the city attorney. Motion made by Councilwoman Beck. Second. Second. Seconded by Councilman Took. A roll call vote here. Councilman Marshall. Yes. Councilman Took. Yes. Councilman Cardin. Yes. Councilman Euler. Yes. And Councilwoman Beck. Yes. Item C is approved. Uh, Councilman Marshall has a request for new business here. All right. An item, but maybe uh, some direction for us. Yep. Thanks, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, at our last city council meeting, we had a conversation. We talked about and then passed a personnel policy. During that conversation, there is a piece of the policy that affects Tier 1 retirement. Um, in a prior conversation with the Personnel Committee, um, Councilmember Beck and myself and the Mayor had a conversation with staff about the direction that we should head with that Tier 1 policy. At that meeting, we agreed as a group that we didn't have enough information to make a, a recommendation to the rest of the Council. And so we agreed to table it. At the city council meeting two weeks ago, that piece, so what happens at the personnel committee, um, staff comes with a draft policy with red lines on it. And they say, what do you think about this? And we debate it and we talk about it. And this section was redlined, just like you saw two weeks ago. Well, we tabled it and that same document got tr transper transported to us as the, as the, the, is the approved policy to vote on. Um, so meaning that we had forgotten to take that piece out. We didn't intend to vote on that at that point, but we did. Um, both Council Member Beck and myself failed to read the entire packet that day, did not comment it on the time, and um, basically allowed you all to just go through without any commentary from us about that policy. So we missed that piece. Um, so what I would, and it, it's a fairly large change, and I don't necessarily want to debate the, the change today because I think that's good for the policy or the um, personnel committee to talk about at a future meeting and come back with a recommendation to the city council, which I think we'll do. Um, the actual change does not go into effect until June, July? July, July 1st. July 1st. So there is some time to, to debate it and talk about it and, and potentially rectify it if we want to. Um, 
I had intended to tell to try to make a motion today to undo what we did two weeks ago, but it needs to be on the agenda before we can do that, and so I can't do that tonight. Um, what I would suggest is that we, if you are okay, we say to the um, personnel committee, go do the research, go make the recommendations, and bring it to the city council um, probably sometime in May to June, and let's have an open conversation about that piece of policy that affects our employees. Um, we haven't done that yet, and that is a failure on my part, and I think Stacy would agree that we together should have had that conversation in public so our employees knew where we were headed. Um, but it took everyone by surprise. The process that we, that we did not follow, I think, needs to be followed, and that would be the personnel committee meeting in the next month, coming up with a recommendation for, the, for this body, and then approving it at that time. Um, I don't like leaving that hanging out there as an approved policy that, that has not had the debate and the conversation, um, but because it isn't going to, in, going to affect until July, I'm willing to have some patience. Um, so my recommendation is, if you are okay, just let us go forward. We'll direct the personnel committee to meet, talk about it, and bring it to you. Sure. Are you really comfortable with that? Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't want to speak for Stacy, but we, the part of the reason that we're on these committees is to take that information, because we all can't be on them, right? Take that information, digest it, and bring it back to you all and have a good conversation. Um, I did not look at that policy prior to coming to this. I assumed it was taken out and I did not do my job when I came to here to have the conversation. That For that, I apologize to you all because that's we have to rely on each other to do that. Otherwise, there's too much work for all of us to do all of it. And so I apologize for that. It won't happen again. Um, we'll fully review the any policy that comes in front of us from now on. So I apologize for that. If I can just add quickly, I admire Shane so much for just being so humble to be like, we've kind of messed up, let's fix it. So we were kind of kicking ourselves for missing it, but also talking to staff, they were also not thrilled that they also missed it. So we're not here to place blame on staff because they're also like, oh, we missed it too. So we'll fix it and get back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Appreciate that. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, uh, that takes us uh, to uh, item 11, to uh, closed session. We have a couple of closed session items after. I move to adjourn to closed session, discuss purchase, exchange, or lease of real property, including any form of water, right, or water shares. Uh, motion made by Councilman Cardin. Second. Seconded by Councilman Euler to uh, adjourn to closed session. All in favor say yes. 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 We're in close. Oh, sorry. Roll call vote for that. Should have done that, Tara. Sorry. Councilman Councilman Took. Yes. Councilman Cardin. Yes. Councilman Euler. Yes. Councilwoman Beck. Yes. And Councilman Marshall. Yes. We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Mallers, for, for being here all night. Yeah. Thank you.